Okay, welcome everybody. This is this is where I seen them before. A celebration of guys. The new <laughs> the new show on the Billionaire Podcast Network. It's me. It's it's Dalton Pruitt. I'm I'm joined today by my good friend Nick Oldershaw. Good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you. This is a reunion of sorts. <laughs> uh, Nick is uh, from the now defunct two podcasts. Two podcasts. Well, the, <laughs> one the at least the last one was ended consensually. Uh, Ooh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Doom Scroll and Coward Hour. Yeah, and now nothing. Now just stand up again. Yeah, people love you, dude. People reach out to me all the time to be like, "Yo, I love Coward Hour," and I'm like, "Why? Well, I, I had nothing to do with that show." <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why you're telling me this. <laughs> hit up Nick. <laughs> yeah, please, please hit me up. Yeah, <laughs> mail things to my house. Yeah, mail mail Nick some anthrax <laughs> so he can spill it on his daughter. His daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could probably pass as like like sort of like a Ben Kingsley type of Muslim. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As in not Muslim at all. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, if you, if you grow your facial hair the right way and. Really funny, he, he has played he has played brown people in like so many fucking movies because he was gandhi i saw him in this other movie called the house of sand and fog where he just fully is playing a muslim guy and it's like bro and that was yeah. in like 2004 which yeah, you know i mean it's like salute the, the grand tradition of hollywood is is finding like you know good white people to be brown people <laughs> Yes, him and uh, him and F. Murray Abram are the two like they're the go to white brown guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, who's the Fisher Stevens? I think he's the other. Example. Yes. Um. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh. You know, it happens. Yeah. You know, who Who better to play a brown guy than a white British guy? I mean, I would love to. I could be like technically, I could be Muslim. There are plenty of white. There, well, I can think of at least three white Muslims. Yeah. Do you have any like Middle Eastern in you? I got a rug yeah. right here, dude. There you go. This is for Salat. Later <laughs> today. No, I have nothing. Uh, I have. I'm my uh, closest thing to. I'm Jewish. Is like the closest thing that I have to uh, any kind of like ethnicity. I mean, that's you know, depending on what kind of Jew you are, it's like basically the same thing. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I know. I think it's Ashkenazi. All I know is that when my grandmother, my grandmother is Jewish, one when her parents. I don't even know when they came here, but they lied and told everybody that they were uh, Native American. Uh, oh, okay. And so, but then we found out, we found out like a couple of years ago that it was actually, they're actually Jewish. We got a good deal on the land. <laughs> 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 we, got, we sold the land at a good deal. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, yeah, Ashkenazis are like, they got, they got the Ellis Island and they're like, well, they got casino, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is this is owned by the the proud uh, Bernstein tribe of the. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Because so Ashkenaz, yeah, but Ashkenazis are like the Seinfeld Jews, the complaining, yes. and then Sephardic are the ones that are ba- basically like like the DJ Khaled's. The the difference is Ashkenazi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, uh, they're both funny, but Ashkenazi Jews know that they're funny. Sephardic Jews are like, fun, like they're just, they're like DJ Khaled is just, he's hilarious. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty is. sure he's Muslim also, but he is oh, hilarious. Okay. <laughs> I just, I just meant like the Sephardic, Sephardic Jews. It's like that, that joke in Zohan, like at the, like near the end of the movie when they all realize, yeah. like, they all look Middle East, like Muslim and Mexican and all that. Like, yes. Sephardic Jews just also look like, that's, that's like the funny thing with Israel and Palestine is it's like, how do how can you even tell, like, who you're, like, what children you're supposed to be killing? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I hate those kids, man. I, I'm with the, I'm with the Israelis on that. Any kid I see holding a rock, I'm like, that's Hamas. You got to get him out of there, dude. I'm a, I'm a hardcore Zionist. Love the Matrix. And... <laughs> uh, I okay. used to, I worked with this. Uh, I worked at the mall uh, with this Israeli guy, uh, Israeli Jew, obviously. Um, at a and it, they truly like. He was so self serious, but anytime he would like try to like. Uh, 
try to like let his guard down or like joke with me a little bit it was like hearing a fucking robot try to try to relate it was like so he would show me these fucking like israeli memes and i was like i have no idea what to make of this dude he was a staunch atheist dude there was this there was this um sorry what were you saying no i he's just they're they're just a very intense people yeah they well there was dude there was this one like sephardic jew in new york who did stand up he was a funny guy because like he he would go on he went he would go to open mics and do like a whole five minute set on pokemon like he he just had like all this material about pokemon and i was like talking to him one day and he was like telling me all these stories about when he was in the idf and and stuff like that and i was like i was like why are you you have like this whole backstory of like being in like an israeli soldier and you're like talking about fucking Pokemon. <laughs> well, because they all do. They they like they, every single person from Israel who like got out, you know, after if if they came of age in Israel, they served in the IDF. So like yeah. it's just you know what I mean. Like yeah, well, you're not going to talk about it all the time because it's boring to people that there. You can talk yeah, about but, Pokemon. Oh yeah, but I mean over <laughs> over here it's like it's it's like you're a Sephardic Jew from Israel. You served in the IDF and you're going on stage at an open mic and be like. Damn, Magikarp is fucking weird, right? Dude, do you think that they have did they, did they have Pokemon Go in Israel? Like, do you think they had it in like <laughs> like war zones in Israel and like disputed territories? Yeah, they, like they, you're they might. you're going to get a fucking uh, you're going to get a fucking Clefairy, but but then a uh, you know Hamas blows up the building that it's in. Like, yeah, they crawl can, through the rubble, you know. Yeah, you can only find like a like a Zapdos in the West Bank. <laughs> that's the only place you find the <laughs> people are risking their lives yeah. for those rare folk. we yeah. were on the Gaza Strip looking for a Snorlax <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. but uh, yeah I don't know I don't know anything about geopolitics I'm not you know I'm not Dosh or Anna I don't you know yeah. <laughs> and we'll we'll get into the show but we you know I guess we do have to address the elephant in the room Patrice O'Neill no um <laughs> Did, did you see that? Did you see that thing Anna tweeted about Russell Brand? Uh, just uh, just automatically defending him. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's funny. You know, it's funny. I do like. Uh, I've listened to Red Scare. You know, and I find parts of it charming. But it like th- sometimes she seems to be such a slave to contrarianism that I'm just like, come on. It's like, did you read the article? I yeah, I read the, it. The it was, Russell Brand article. It was it was some rough stuff. Yeah. It's it's also kind of like you know it's like when you've got like a a rock st- like a cool British guy who used to be addicted to heroin whose whole thing is that he's like a sexual hedonist. It's like yeah, it's you know it's like what it's like of course th- this stuff was happening. You think it was like wholesome? You think there's like wholesome hedonistic sex where like some of the girls aren't like pressured into it or people like don't have weird feelings about it afterwards? Well, yeah, definitely. For- Every everybody yeah. everybody gives off a vibe, you know. Like anytime these stories mm-hmm. break, it's like even with Louis, and like the Louis stuff was always like kind of dubious. But even with him, I'm like, yeah, this sounds like some shit that he would do, you know. Yeah, and and, and, he, like, and he and he admitted to it. It is some shit that he would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like with, with like Russell Brand or Danny Masterson, Cosby, like all these people have like a vibe where you can tell like something's off. Like so, there's something weird going on with these people. And yeah. um, yeah, and it's I yeah, he always came across as like a fuck. I you know, the, I like my thing is like any anybody who gets like way too into like spiritual like guruism and, and wellness yeah. and stuff, they have like the ohm tattoo. It's it's like fuck, keep that dude in arm's length because those guys usually are are up to no good sexually. To me, the the anybody who goes from like comedian to movie star to like youtube like yeah youtube cult leader it's just like it's clear because that what that clearly to me that that just reads as somebody who like you it's almost like you uh it, it each one of those is a similar kind of power trip and it's almost like the buzz wears off, like the novelty and the buzz wears off from being comedian to like okay i want to be in the fucking movies and then it's just like yeah i'm just gonna be like a a thought leader like you're, yeah. you're just you're just cutting out the middleman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a, it's a respectable con. It's a good grift, but you you know, yes. it's it's. I I love I love a good grift, but you know, you if you're gonna you know if you're gonna do that, don't don't be raping. But yeah, I mean, any anybody who's like 
his whole thing is like, it's like, what if Alan Watts was Alex Jones? It's like a combination <laughs> of what, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. he, he's, he's like a spiritual leader and wellness guru, but also fighting back against the lies of the mainstream media. It's, his whole thing. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, he just, he's, I guess the point I'm trying to make is like, he seems like it's weird for as verbose as he is and he doesn't seem like a total idiot he doesn't seem like anybody who like cares about art or anything so you know what i mean so it's like it's weird that he was even doing like comedy or movies to begin with because he mainly just seems in like hyping up his own you know yeah yeah he's, he's a he's a con artist like, no I, I know no i of course yeah and he got he got like now that like, it's you know now that everything's come to light it kind of it kind of looks like if you follow the the trail of tears of his career <laughs> it kind of looks like he got ran out of the uk because he was huge on all those like chat shows and panel shows for a while yeah and then he and then he just stopped getting booked for that shit so then he can't like came over here and was in movies and shit for a while it was like really big over here and then like i guess with all the Katy perry stuff he kind of lost favor with people and it i don't win i i don't even, i don't remember like when he made the pivot to like be, being like what he is now the the sort of it, like it, it was interesting i think honestly i think i think part of it happened while you were in your fugue state but i remember <laughs> i think that might be why you i forget that you're a time traveler dude um but uh yeah. i i think he like initially he started the youtube channel because like his career was kind of over although he was in the fucking minions movie last year so i don't know those but, are good. Uh, they are good his, his career was over and then initially he was just like a like a like a wellness youtuber like not even that like conspiracy minded like pretty left leaning and then he had jordan peterson on once he was like i he was like i believe in in uh, having conversations with people i don't agree with and then like he had jordan peterson on and then the next fucking thing you know it's like he's only having right wing idw dudes on and now oh, he's like Yes, all, yes, right, and he's and it's and it's all like like every episode's about the vaccine. Every so, it happened kind of quick, honestly. I yeah. think he 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 caught the scent of what he could do, and then just went just ran with it. Yeah, it's you know it's a it's a it's a I you know I've said it's, it's a respectable and lucrative <laughs> grift. I guess and, so. And then you know, and there's I saw online like people have been speculating for years that like one of the reasons he probably did this was to like galvanize himself against these accusations coming to light that like interesting one, once this happens he's positioned himself as this like danger to the establishment so any sort of like pushback against him in any way like you know five different women saying that he raped them is a coordinated attack on yeah. someone who's exposing the like big pharma or what what's like. what's so crazy about that to me is like it just seems like you know i don't know man it's like you have residuals from movies you were still getting work it's like are you that addicted to fame that you couldn't just because again like he's not even he could just he could just like quietly retire with his money instead of like being like i have to play like a uh i have to like five years out make myself a bulletproof <laughs> cult leader so that when these allegations come i can keep grifting money from people i just i don't Part of me is like, my God, that seems so exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. All these people are mentally, it's, it's like it's attention more, like more than anything is just so intoxicating. Cause it's like, at the, you know, at that level is, is it, I mean, is it really about the money or is it just like maintaining some sort of relevance and like yeah. a, attention from people? Cause like, I got a taste of it. Like I just have like a few thousand skanks fans who told me I'm gay <laughs> and it was i was like so addicted to the attention like i didn't even realize like i wasn't even making any fucking money it was just like yeah oh, the attention's nice <laughs> i mean i i mean tr i mean tr and that's i mean people there are thousands of people every day who get conned into careers in entertainment off the promise of attention and nothing else because it literally feels that good it feels feels almost as good as the money it feels like you're succeeding like yeah. Do you do you know who Jay Whitecotton is? Uh, I think I've seen his. I've seen him on Twitter. I want to like. Is he a comic? He's an Austin guy, and he okay. he's like he's really really funny, and also like extremely mentally ill. So he's he's one of those like savant comedians who's like one of the funniest guys I've ever met, but also 
maybe too sick in the head to actually succeed. Yeah. I don't know. He's he's a really funny guy, but he he kind of talks some sense into me. Like as as things were like kind of like it, when it looked like me, Robbie and Joe and all that were like succeeding in some way. He like he called me. He was like, "Hey, I, w- I want to let you know, like you're not actually succeeding. You're just getting attention." Like this is not like you, like you have a podcast and whatever, but like this is not what success looks like. So please don't let this like drive you crazy. No, and- but you know, but that's that's fucking real, dude. I remember being like a delusional open micer, like big in my own scene, and I would like I would like post a Facebook status that got like two hundred likes, and I would literally in my head I was like, this is good for my career. I was literally like, I remember, dude, I was like, when I was still doing like pills and opiates, I remember like, I remember like popping a bunch of hydrocodone, having an opiate dream that I had a Facebook status that was so funny. They invited me on the Ellen DeGeneres show. <laughs> and it's like, and, it, and honestly, it's just like, it's just like that mindset to like the 10th degree. You're right. It's just attention. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, a t- yeah. Well, it, it's all, it's, it's just, it's funny how like, and we'll get into the show, but it's, it's sure. Yeah. No, well, let's catch up. Let's catch up. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny how like just doing open mics because like all these like people that have succeeded in comedy, they all say the same thing where they're like, "Hey, if you do an open mic, you're a comedian at that point." So it's like just doing open mics by that metric makes you a comedian. So then you're like hanging out with like all these different levels of like success or seeming success. So you like people who who are just open micers think they're like in the comedy business and like never realize that they're they're not doing anything they're not succeeding i would have those moments like i'd be at the stand sitting at a table with like all these like headliners and we'd all be laughing and riffing or whatever and then i'd have this like stark realization where i'd be like oh i have i'm the only one here with like 11 dollars in my bank account right now (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) yeah it's it's really strange what it like just the attention does to you where you're like i'm making it and it's like oh i know i can't pay my rent (laughs) well are you i mean i think some it's funny i'm of two minds about that because i also think that like there we are fastly approaching a place where even the people who made it three years prior to like us came up in a very different environment where there was there was more money even five years ago for comedians than there is now i feel like sure um but i don't know there's something something that is actually kind of nice um not having and part of the reason why i've like decided not to have a podcast yet is that i do just want to take the time to actually be good at the thing that the podcast should have been supporting which is like you know when when my podcast was like when carrot hour was like at its most popular I wasn't doing stand up at all. And I had more fans than I ever had than when I was just doing stand up. But I didn't have any actual skills to back it up. Podcasting is kind of a skill, but not really, you know. Um it is, I mean it is. It's it's a different skill set. It's like broadcasting. It it is, but I would but I also think that less it takes less work to become good at it than uh than to be a really good stand up. Like I, I can think of a bunch of great broadcast podcasters who are mediocre standups, and, and I don't know if I can really think of the reverse of that. I think most people who are good at standup are good at are like good at podcasting. Um, but my but my point being, like, sometimes it's nice to just like take a step back and just like be good at the thing, just like take take satisfaction in being good at the thing that you do, regardless of how many people are watching, which is like a new thing that I'm really enjoying. Yeah, I get that. You know. I'm pivoting to the grift. I'm just like, you know. all right. I forgot. I, I, I'm so off brand right now. This is the billionaire podcast network. Dude. Yeah, this is the bill. You're on the billionaire podcast network. Cha ching, bing, 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 bing. Fill her up. Fill her up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I've talked to people just like regular f- civilians, you know, and, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> pedestrians, as Bert Kreischer calls them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> People do that are nowadays. It seems like gravitate towards podcasts. Like I've I've talked I've had like so many conversations where like somebody will tell like tell me like who like one of their favorite comedians is, but then like you talk to them and then like at some point in the conversation they'll be like, yeah, I've actually never seen their stand up. <laughs> like you said, yeah. they're one of your favorite comics. 
Well, it, I mean, that's <laughs> the, I can see why it is like the why it's the preferred format now because it does kind of it just removes all the pretense of stand up comedy. You don't you know you no longer have to like work really hard to sound like you're being spontaneous when delivering a joke when you just have content that you put out every week but at the same time i also like i don't want to encourage i look at how fucking bad content is now mm -hmm. like i scroll instagram and tiktok tiktok and i'm just kind of like aghast even in fucking movies i'm like aghast at what is considered passable and beyond passable what most people consider to be really good and i'm just like yeah it's like losing the gold standard i don't know it, do, it does it, just because people want it doesn't mean that you should uh you should be content with with not pushing yourself to like create something a little bit better. Right. I don't know. That's where I'm at right now. I mean, I'm I'm in the content mill. I'm just making the slot for the trough. But <laughs> that's that's a survival. You know, that's a survival mechanism for me. Of course, of but, course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've never come across like a uh, like a TikTok sketch or re Instagram reel sketch that I thought was good. I was like. They put all this like money and production and like effort into these things, and they have the the fucking subtitles and whatever. Well, there's a guy. My mom loves this guy. She's like, she's like, have you ever thought about doing this? It's this guy who just takes like they're not even jokes. I think some of them are like street jokes, but they're like premises. They're like our shower thoughts, and he just films himself. The text is over his head, and he just looks at the camera and then looks away and then looks back in the camera, and the the text will say something like. Uh, I don't know, something stupid, like a, think of any street joke. That's what it is. Right. And this guy has like, he's monetized it. He's millions of followers. Yeah. He's making a living off of this. I, yeah. And I know, I know you're saying, you're saying like, yeah, I want to get that. No, I get that. But I, I don't know. It like, it's something about it just eats away at me. It's soulless. Like, yeah. It's, nothing, yeah, but it's bad. There's nothing there. It's just, it's just con like, it, like whatever gets people like, gets the eyes on you like you make money doing that but don't you think that we're that we're that we're living in hell <laughs> like, don't you? that's one way yeah that's one way to look at it another yeah. way to another way to look at it is just like almost like deadwood where it's like there's a there's a veritable gold mine that we got to reconnoiter and that gold mine is a uh, content <laughs> i guess that's content. true i guess yeah. that's true i mean i you know i i don't know like yeah it seems like nothing's good anymore and i'm not like i don't think like i i don't have the um what's the word i'm like, like ego or or anything in me that thinks i could make anything that's particularly good it's just, but i could get into content <laughs> but you could you could make something that's good this is maybe what kills me. maybe that's so, that's so self-defeating you're a funny guy you have like you're well read you have like a unique perspective on things it's like you could make something good i think maybe it doesn't it'll, it'll take it'll, well it's gonna take me a while i gotta i gotta recover from just like everything that like happened to me but that's true that's, that's why it's like it's like right now just fucking do the content and then once once i get once I get to that point where I'm like peddling different kinds of snake oils, like, you know, Kratom and, and penis pills and, and <laughs> right. ball ball creams and stuff yes. like that, then I can really pursue being an art, artist. Sponsorship, you know? sponsorship first. <clears throat> yeah. Before you've done anything. We start with the spawn. The first brick of the pyramid is sponsors. I, yeah, I want I want to sell out it as, as soon as I can. And then, and then use the, like leverage that to actually like be a you know be an artist you know I don't know that was like shit you know Shane I, one of the few conversations I had with Shane was he was like um he was telling me like yeah just you know like you need to just focus on stand up that you know that's like the way to actually do it and it's you know that's one way to do it or. You could just you could just be the be a grifter. <laughs> well, I had the, I had the same conversation with him. It was after Carrot Hour broke up. I went to see him at the stand. I spilled. I was so drunk and so upset. I spilled my guts on him, um, which I regret doing a little bit. But he he did give me a piece of advice that stuck with me, which was like uh, I was like you know this like I was like this was how I was going to make it. And he goes nah. He's like just he's like do stand up. Stand up's the thing that you should love. And it's it. Took me a while to actually really come around on that. I, I do think it was good advice, actually, but uh, I don't know. Maybe he's wrong. He maybe might. Be like, it's different for everybody. He's he's just like so so naturally like just a genius at it that it's easy for him to say stuff like that because 
he, I've you know I've talked about this, but like the the week that he got fought, like all that shit happened, like SNL and all that, I went and saw him do stand up, and I was like, I could just tell, I was like, oh, this, I mean, this guy's gonna be famous no matter what. Like it's every. I remember the, I think everybody who has seen him, I have an experience of like when he was, when we were just doing like a, he did Magoobies in Baltimore, the, the new talent contest. He won it that year. I was on this show too. I didn't even place, but I remember like the people who came to watch me, they were like, oh, Shane's going to be on TV. This is the first time they'd seen him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he just has that. He has that juice. Yeah. So you know what? Maybe what the hell is he doing? Giving regular people the advice of just focus on, you're right. Yeah. I should be grifting. Oh my. God, I can't believe how stupid. I mean, well, I my my thought is like you know, it, 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 everybody's like different. Everybody has like their own path, like path they've gone down. Mm-hmm. But it's it's like at the I, like I think at the end of the day, nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about when it comes to like trying to create some sort of roadmap or give advice because there's no yeah. rhyme, or, there's no rhyme or reason for any of it. Like all those people that talk about like you know, it takes at least ten years to get good at this, blah blah blah, and it's it's like. Maybe I mean maybe maybe that's a metric, but then I mean there's some people who do it for just like four or five years and they're fucking headlining and getting, yeah getting all these de- like yeah so it's it's I I kind of like I think Malcolm Gladwell like fucked everybody's heads with that ten thousand hour shit because that's kind of bullshit. I'm more didn't of like, he just he like just made it up anyway didn't like it's, not, made, it's not yeah I think he might have made it up or I I don't know but <clears> I I'm I'm more of like. Fran Lebowitz said something interesting in that that docu series she did that yeah. I kind of believe more than anything. Where, where she's like, the she was saying like the thing that frustrates everyone about talent is that it's random. That like some people are born being really good at a certain thing and other people aren't. And there's no like rhyme or reason for like who gets what talent or like why they're good at certain things. And yeah. I was like, that that makes more sense than anything. That some people just like have some innate ability that they're just like already good at, and then they can hone it and just get better and better at it. And then other people don't, you know. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's like jelking. You yeah. can make your cock a little bit bigger, but if it's small, it's going to basically be small. <laughs> It'll be small forever. <laughs> It'll be small forever. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you know, we've met the guys who like just do have been doing open mics for decades. Sure, and, yeah. Or you, you're just like, how how have you not gotten better at this? <laughs> you just you've been doing but this th- forever. But then some of those guys do weirdly like pull. Some of the guys who like really stick with it, I've seen some people like actually pull ahead to finally be like. I can actually think of comedians who I watched not be able to put a joke together for probably like four years straight and then they actually figure it out and now they're actually doing pretty well um which is also like you know that's the other side of that coin of like there is i i have always kind of maintained that actually most people could do stand-up and i think it actually ties right into what we're talking about with what what passes for acceptable content these days like if you look at the comedians that headline like these like comedy clubs in miami where it's like you're not you're not paying to go see a comedian. You, you're you're paying to like basically for a babysitter. Right. Have you ever seen like these fucking like Miami crowd work clips? Um, where yeah, I've seen stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that's a skill that that most people could learn and be successful and like make money doing. Um, I think that the spectrum of like what qualifies as as stand up is pretty vast, but some people don't have the sense to even figure that out. I guess is your point. Yeah, I mean, well, it, and it also it can just be a war of attrition where it's like, like if you stick with it long enough and just keep like hammering away at it, you can eventually figure out the formula. And is this a funny podcast? <laughs> like, is this, I don't do, know. Do people talk, like this? I don't I know. Feel we- I always feel weird talking about this kind of stuff. I we're never get, know. We're getting into like the, the Rogan territory. Like we're talking shop, dude. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, there's probably only like a thousand people who are any like can actually do comedy. You know, the, <laughs> <laughs> the modern day philosophers. Well, that's what we do. We're warriors. I do feel like I would have to say I have really enjoyed being a warrior again every night when I. <laughs> A verbal, a verbal assassin. <laughs> I like being a verbal assassin. The way that I wield the N word is with. I mean, I, I, it's it's yeah. dangerous, but just. It's the the same way, like uh, ha, like Hanzo Atori would make a katana. <laughs> You're I'm folding, fold- folding the N word. <laughs> I've folded the hard R over a thousand times on its 
<laughs> but, well, sharpen the hard R. <laughs> dude, you know what's so funny? I was at a, I was at a, um, I went to an open mic last week at this, this pretty cool little comedy club in Chicago called the Red Room Comedy Club. And there is sometimes you just see everybody there is pretty nice. Sometimes you just see an open micer who you who is obviously crazy. This guy had shaved his head except for his hair right up front, which he had like twisted into like a, it almost looked like a almost like a Glenn Danzig type thing except he oh. was completely bald except for oh, this, he, like, he looked like the, like the pringles guy like, uh, uh no because it was sticking up he looked like Al- uh, like alfalfa like alfalfa if alfalfa was bald but he still had the notable <laughs> the notable oh, yeah. spike like and this oh guy, like, Char- like charlie brown <laughs> yes like, okay <laughs> um and so and like and he sits down next to me he's covered in tattoos this latino guy and i just like got this like psychic vibe i was like this guy's gonna say the n-word in his set i was like i just like i just like got like it was just served to me by the universe he's gonna say the n-word and like a fucking soothsayer this guy gets on stage and he goes okay welcome to frank's three minutes of hell we're gonna he goes we're gonna talk about the most uncomfortable word in the english language and did three minutes on the n-word where he said it like eight times it was incredible this is a mostly black comedy club right i uh, it was i was like man <laughs> welcome to hell <laughs> He's, he said he calls it he calls his set three minutes of hell, three minutes of hell. <laughs> his name uh, is frank something i gotta i wonder if he's got he probably has videos of him doing this shit online somewhere oh my god we're gonna talk about the most dangerous <laughs> word word, in the <laughs> and he started talking about all the words that it's in like so he's like you know vinegar arnold schwarzenegger but he's he's mispronouncing because like you don't really like yeah sure technically it's in those words but he's hitting it real fucking hard right. it was so funny right i mean it was i mean like it was bombing but i was sitting there just like it's it's so rare you get to see somebody just that 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 a room would sanction this man's insanity until un, until he got the light it's just a crime against humanity <laughs> yeah, no, it really I'm, should be stopped dude that's that's the best thing about open mics is like no matter how fucking crazy someone is they still or afforded their like three, four, five minutes. Like, yeah, oh. it's it, it's completely democratic. I mean, it's yeah, like... it's like that. Uh, did like that? Did you have you ever seen that Sam Hyde like the like gut gut a man? I think gut a man, <laughs> gut a man. They call me gut a man, gut a man, cause I be doing that, doing yeah. that. like a crack a do, <laughs> like a crack a do, like a crack a do, dude. Gut a man oh. is insane. Dude, I've watched Go to Man so many times. It's so fucking funny. And and nobody in the audience has like any clue what he's doing. No, it's at like one of the like like a basement. I I feel like it's like a basement open mic in Boston. It's it's so unfort it's it's so rude to do to those people. <laughs> Dude, he I mean he that's his whole he loves that. He loves just like bombing in front of unwilling participants. <laughs> yes, it's I, I remember being like a, I remember like following, he was really doing stand-up for a minute um i think he's doing it again I, he's a he's a guy that i like that i go in and out of even being able to like engage with his content because sometimes it's just like this feels so this feels so like molded in like the they feel so forged in evil sometimes where i'm just like my god dude yeah i was watching i saw like a clip from that uh that idubs documentary yeah and evil. i yeah, I, I dubs kind of made a good point. I, I I don't know anything about I dubs or like what's going on between those two, mm-hmm. but I dubs kind of made a good point that like like hanging out with Sam Pine, like trying to do this documentary is like kind of frustrating because you can never. He was like, I, I I can't tell like why he's doing what he's doing. Like it's coming from, I can't tell like what's actually sincere, what's ironic, and why like why he's acting this way. I I, th- I think the secret is that it's mostly sincere honestly yeah. i i i think i think that's really like the secret of 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 sam hyde is that it was misinterpreted as irony because it was so extreme and he kind of like had a he kind of la- like th- there there's like a there's like a faux satirical element to it where he's obviously laughing and the graphics and the outfits are ridiculous but he he's literally just saying things that he thinks yeah, that you that know. was sort of that was sort of the point Idubs was making. Is he, he like he called it meta irony, where it's it's like 
saying things you like being sincere in an ironic way to like bulletproof yourself against any sort of criticism like yeah just but it's interesting though because i don't even think he's trying to bulletproof him i think that he would just openly be like yeah yeah you know what i mean like i think that like i think that's actually like uh i think even labeling it meta irony is down to like i dubs interpretation of it because i don't even think it's that deep for those guys i think that they are funny and i think that they deliver things in a funny way but it's just they're just fucking nuts yeah they, yeah they're just weirdos yeah i don't know <laughs> i <clears throat> i've met people like that who are just like oh, i can never tell like what's a character or, like what's going on like well, I, i'm like why is this person acting this way i, I have no i can't get a read on this I definitely like I will say, man, when I when Brandon and I were doing Coward Hour and he he disappeared into it deeper than me. We had, there were a lot of things that we were doing as bits, um, but you get lost in it, you know, and you start to really be unable to, like, separate yourself from this thing that you're doing because it's funny and it's kind of like aesthetically interesting. And then you're like, OK, well, I should like should I double down on it because I don't want to seem like, oh, you yeah. know, the, the, yeah, com- the come town paradox. The come down, all the although even the the come down guys, I don't think ever got that. They were always pretty aware that they were joking, but I mean, to yeah, to be honest, it's like yeah, no. When I was like younger, doing a podcast, adopting all these things, like being like a being like a trad cat who's who hates sex, you know, mm-hmm. that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's an outrageous thing to say, but you feel like you're like, well, I don't want to be a fucking phony, so I'll really double down on it. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's that Vonnegut thing, or it's what does he say? Be careful what you pretend to be lest you become that the thing that you're i'm paraphrasing no 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 but but yes and it's easy it's an easy trap for like young men to fall into too i think because so much of like forging your identity at that that at that age like makes you susceptible to that yeah becoming like yeah like an ironic edge lord kind of guy and it's like yeah i'm just i'm just doing bits i'm just joking and then like then you're at the January 6th riot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's a goof. <laughs> Dude, that definitely happened because like when there are people at the January 6th riot who are dressed as Arthur from the Super Nintendo game Ghouls and Ghosts, it's like, come on. It's like, you don't care about the border, dude. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You should be at Comic-Con right now. We're, yeah, it's or like fucking like Chrissy Mayer going there to... <laughs> to die. Yeah. Do Instagram live like I'm here, I'm here at the riot. Yeah, oh my God, what this a beautiful the... woman! I know, right? I mean, I just a stunning she a, her a stunning visage on display every time I she graces my Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> did you see where? Uh, and we'll, we'll get we'll get into the show. But did you see? <laughs> <laughs> my Michael Che actually like called her out a few months ago, like because she had she was on some like news thing. And she she had made some like half ass veiled joke about how like black people like fried chicken, and yeah. Michael Michael Che like called it out on Instagram. It was so bad. Yeah, yeah, and he he said something like, "Oh, I yeah, I remember seeing this lady at open mics like ten years ago. Good good to see she's doing well." <laughs> <laughs> what was her her joke about fried chicken was so fucking stupid too. It killed you know, what what killed me about all this is like my you know my dad follows Fox News and he because like Fox News kept profiling like. God, they profiled like Josh Denny, uh, Chrissy Mayer, and another comedian. And like he started watching their stand up. And my dad has good, my dad actually th- thinks good, good things are funny, but because they were co signed by Fox News, he was like, Have you seen Chrissy Mayer? This girl's hilarious. She's the next Amy Schumer. And I was like, God damn, <laughs> it's it's crazy how easily that works on people. Oh yeah, for sure. My my dad's like a big fan of Jimmy Dore, and <laughs> dude. Uh, yeah, my my uh, Jimmy Dore used to be like, oh yeah, it was. She was talking about. Uh, they were talking about Chick Fil A, and she was like, they sell fried chicken. I don't know how inclusive they. I don't know how much more inclusive they can get. Number one, let's be clear. They do not sell fried. I mean, they do sell a kind of fried chicken. It is not an authentic. It's not like the kind of fried chicken that you stereotypically think of. No, yeah, it's, it's such not... a fucking reach. It's nuggets, dude. It's nuggets and tenders. What a reach. Yeah, it's, it's pathetic. Nuggets and chicken sandwiches. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like 
Honestly, it is, it is like fried chicken for like white people who are scared of black people. Dude, that's my that's my thing with raising canes right now. Everybody loves raising canes. Raising canes is fried chicken for white people. I'm right it there with a, you, brother. It's a it's a pathetic tender. They don't even they do no boning chicken. It's just tenders. That's pathetic. It's, it's just tendies, and they're not even that good. And it's like the selling point is like I I like I understand they're doing like the in and out thing where it's like we have a simple menu, not no fuss, no muss, no funny business. Mm-hmm. But it's it's like the selling point is like we, tenders and like this whatever like weird sauce they have, dude. They call it Texas toast. It is not fucking Texas toast. It's just it's just a thick piece of bread that they threw on the grill for thirty seconds. Yeah, it's not fucking. It kills it. there, and also you can sign up for the military. <laughs> raising they're like they're 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 raising kids are like recru- army recruiting stations now. I like it's, that. You like that? I like that. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I, like if if you love fried like to eat, the Filipinos make better fried chicken at fucking Jollibee. Really, I've never eaten Jollibee. I'm a jo- I'm evangelical about Jollibee. You like Jollibee because I went into one once and I looked at the menu and I'm like, I'm not going to order spaghetti at a fast food restaurant. You know, you'd be really. I like a fast food restaurant that will give me a yum burger with a pineapple. I like being able to get a burger with a pineapple on it, two pieces of fried chicken, white rice, and gravy. Okay. All at the same place. It's kind of sick, dude. I I really like Jollibee. I'll have to I'll, try it. I didn't the, know they the, had the pi- pineapple burger. That's one of my favorite things. I, I don't. They may not anymore because they cycle out menu items. But you can also you can get like a you can get like for they've actually made the menu less weird since they've exploded in popularity. But you used to be able to get like palabak and um, like beef steak with like mushrooms and gravy on it. But to me, it's like there's just the flavor combination of fried chicken and white rice with gravy. That sounds good. What is, isn't that, what do they call that? It's like, um, Momofuku, Momo, Momo. Is, is it Momofuku? But it's not, it, no. it's not, it, it's not exactly like that though. You know what I'm talking about? I, for, I forget what it's called. Uh, it's not Mofungo. Moco? Moco Loco? Moco Loco. Moco, lo- let me see this here. Yeah. Whereas it's, it's it's like some like meat and rice and gravy. Yeah, but this is Hawaii. It, this ha- it has a different. It's it, it's different than this because this even looks like it's not as uh, savory. Yeah, I don't know. There's just something insanely novel about getting like Popeyes quality fried chicken and then white rice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Popeyes, Popeyes got Popeyes got that red beans and rice. That's good. Popeyes is we've been doing the I've been blowing all my friends' minds. I went to New York, dude. It was like I felt like uh I don't know what. This is just a, a byproduct of being poor. But none of my friends in New York knew that every Popeyes receipt on the back uh has a deal for two free pieces of chicken and a biscuit if you save mm-hmm. it. I, I showed them that. I'm like, you can literally combo chain every two weeks, you can combo chain free chicken together. And eat like a yeah, combo the, chain. Yeah, like dude. Mortal Kombat. Yes, the yeah, dude. This is the secret combination. And they all these, all these fucking, all these rich. They all call me the Johnny stuff. Cage of Popeyes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They all these all these rich alt comics from Brooklyn. I blew their minds. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, dude. I'm just I'm just unlocking secrets of the universe for these kids. Yeah. Yeah, you you have no clue what what cool prizes you get on your receipts <laughs> people this is people are so they lead such cushy lives now they don't they don't scour the back of every receipt they get for a potential free item that could sustain mm-hmm. them later in the week <laughs> yeah i mean i don't i've never had money and i i just lived foolishly i just th- you know yeah. i just throw receipts away and just completely waste money and now i have yeah. to you know and i have to make a billion dollars podcasting uh, <laughs> <laughs> but i, I told have... oh go ahead no, and and we'll get into the show. But I told Robbie, <laughs> I told Robbie this, the, like my philosophy on grifting, like to make the pivot into being a grifter is like we've we've seen every iteration of the grift, like from like Ben Shapiro, Jordan B. Peterson, Matt Walsh, Tim Dillon, Dasha, and all. We've seen like all these people establish themselves as like different ideologues, and, and like they're being like con men under the pretense of some some sort of like political ideology or something, right? And, and what I'm doing, I, I I don't know what to call it, but I guess it's it's like a postmodern grift, where it's it's like the grift is the grift, where like I'm just telling people, like I'm like, 
just openly admitting like I'm a con man. I'm doing this for no other reason than I want to make money. And I'm tricking people into giving me their money by telling them the truth. Right. You're right. Essentially like, yeah. I mean, like, are you tricking them or are they just like of their own volition being like, I like Dalton. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate the, that he's being honest. That's the grift. Yeah. It's just, ha just having like, I, I guess like a personality people like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But just just openly saying like what I, I'm doing, what I'm doing for no other reason than I want to make money. I have no interest in like helping anyone or preaching any sort of ideology or positioning myself as a thought leader. I guess that's a grift. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the, the the grift of grifts. It, I, it might just be like uh like um charismatic panhandling. Yeah. I'm I'm like yeah I'm the the Uncle Baby Billy of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're re, we're rewatching. Sorry, I I don't mean to go off on a tangent. Man, we're rewatching Justified right now. Have you ever watched Justified? I've never watched it, but I, I hear it's great. It it's good, and man, Walton Goggins is so fucking good and everything he's in. We're just, we've just been appreciating how good he is. He's a guy. He's one of the guys. Yeah. And so, and, and and so, I guess that leads that leads us into the show. <laughs> yes, <laughs> where finally. I see where I've seen them before, a celebration of guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want I wanted to do this, uh, and I guess now we're what like an, an hour? hour an hour into it. <laughs> I wanted mm. to do this because, like, this is this is one of my sort of like autistic obsessions is like guys. What they, I guess, what they call character actors, which I, I ne I've never understood what that term means because, like, every actor is playing a character. Be like, you know, would, would you call it, would you call a chef a food chef? You know, anyway, yeah, I, I, I haven't been able to do stand up, so I'm just working out some, some bits right now. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, I, I just, I don't really know what the term means. I've, I've heard it and I like, I understand how it's used, but I don't know, like, why they're called character actors. Well, because they, uh, oftentimes they, they're not actors who like sell movies. Not that any actor does that anymore, but, but there was a time when like, even though like you probably, Steve Buscemi is like an A-list talent, you know, I would definitely yeah. say. I don't, he's not a B-list. Who for a long time was like a character actor. I, I think he still is. Cause I don't think, I don't think that if you put Steve Buscemi, I don't think he's a leading man. You know what I mean? Right. E even in movies where he is a leading man, it's not like those are movies that are like widely, they're not getting wide releases. Yeah, some of these people do kind of have, like make the crossover. Like every now and then, they'll lead a movie mm -hmm. in, in a weird way. Like Will Willem Dafoe has done that a couple times. Yes, Willem, Dafoe, he's an ascended character actor. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like I feel like Goggins is on the cusp of possibly yeah. doing that. Um, it's fun. To, it's fun when it goes the other way too. Like Mickey Rourke who was a leading man and is now one of the best character actors. Like yeah. I love when he appears in a small role. Yeah. And, and I think like Brad Pitt is kind of heading into that territory. Yes. In a weird way. Like I, people said that about his character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like, I know he's the leading man in that movie, but he, he kind of plays it like a character actor. Yeah. And uh, yeah. The, so, it's, you know, there, there's some code switching that can happen. <laughs> yeah um because i think harry, harry dean stanton had a leading role at one point yes uh paris texas although that is not it's not like that was like a german american kind of like art house movie um it's right. not like i think a lot of people saw it but it's not like it was like a studio like harry dean stanton in yeah you know. and um and then yeah and some some of these guys like do kind of become like tv stars every now and then like Stephen Root, oh, yeah. like Stephen Root is just all over TV now. Like I, th there was a, like within the last two years, he was uh, either starring or had like a prominent role on three different H like HBO shows. Yeah, like He's he, he was he was on Succession, Perry Mason, and Barry all like while they were all airing at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean this this is just like I don't know, just like a weird obsession of mine because I always look for these guys in movies. Like I try to see like. Who do I recognize? And like, can I like, where have I seen them before? I don't know. I, it's just just one of those things I I'm like obsessed with, I guess, because like they, these guys are like all like so fucking talented, but they just they don't have that like movie star quality. Like either they're like not conventionally attractive or 
just for like whatever reason, like where they thrive is just like these smaller roles that kind of like glue the movie together. And um and and a lot of people have no fucking clue what I'm talking about when I talk about this shit. And I can't yeah. I can't do it on my main show because like the two guys I do that show with don't know movies at all. Like we we recorded an episode last night where um where uh we were talking about Pacific Rim and yeah. I'm, I mentioned Guillermo del Toro and one of my co-hosts was like I have no idea who you're talking about and I go are you serious really like, yeah he was he was like yeah, I hate this shit you're always talking about like these weird guy like guys no one's ever heard of and I'm like I'm like hey man a lot of people know who Guillermo del Toro is <laughs> he's one of <laughs> he, he, he's one of the like celebrity directors right now yeah like, he's he's one of the names he's like one of the most ce- like celebrated filmmakers of all time. Yeah. He's like, you're kind of the weird one for not knowing. Like, you haven't seen Hellboy? <laughs> it's so weird to me. Yeah. Um, but so we, we in in t- today's top, you know, this is the inaugural episode where where I've seen him before, a celebration of guys. Uh, I was just I was thinking about him at Walsh the other day because he's one of those, he's just a guy. You know, I well, see him and he makes me so happy. There, there's a Roger Ebert. Uh, who i love it's fine I, sometimes he writes movie reviews where i'm just like man i don't agree with you if you have showed your fucking work on this one he had a rule about M. Emmett walsh yeah he called it like i don't know if he called it the M. Emmett walsh principle or something along those lines to something to that effect but he was like there is no no movie that he is in can be entirely bad because yeah. he in his nature will elevate it yeah yeah and that's what i love about guys the guys like this like especially him is like even if it's a shitty movie, as soon as he shows up, it's like, at least this is good. Yes. This is great. Like, whatever he's doing, I love this. And, and like, anytime I've seen him, and it is, that is kind of like the difficulty of doing a show like this is like, I want to do a deep dive, but then like, you look at any of these guys' filmography, especially his, and it's like, well, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to go through. I, like, I, I can't possibly watch 200 movies. <laughs> I don't know how to go have... through all of, all of this, but. I've seen a lot. Of, I've seen. Well, I don't know. If I've seen some of these. I haven't seen. I've seen a lot of his movies. He. He's in so many good fucking movies, but he's I haven't in, seen Free Willy too. I I haven't seen Free. I guess that's one I gotta check out. But he's also, <laughs> he, he's also just a guy that like you may like a lot of people may not even realize they they've seen him in like everything. Like it's it's so just, crazy. He's alive. He was in a movie last year. He was on Gemstones. Like the. Season before this one, he played John Goodman's dad in the show. Oh shit! Wait, who? What was he in? Was he in? Uh, that's right. He was in Frasier. He was in Tim and Eric's bedtime stories too. Yeah, he's just a, he's a, he was in Knives Out. He's he's still working. He's like eighty something, and he, he's also he's also got that weird quality where he's just always been old. Like, yes. I, I've, I've never known him to not be an old man. Like I was. Have you have you seen um that episode of Tales from the Crypt? He did. Uh, we're on a Tales from the Crypt rewatch right now. I don't think, unless I'm misremembering. It's, it's the sixth episode of the first season and, um. Collection completed. Yeah, it's him, it's him and the lady that played, uh, Mrs. Roper on Three's Company. And, um, he's like, he's like retiring. So now he's got to spend all day at home with his wife and his wife is like this child, like a childless woman which um, I guess now, you know, honestly, now I think it, all the women now should watch this. All these childless <laughs> whores, you know. Jo- we need to we need to show Jordan B. Peterson this episode because um, and, and so she's kind of nutty and like just collects animals. Like there's fucking animals everywhere, and so like now he's got to spend all this time at home with her. And um, the funny thing about the episode is he keeps bitching like forty seven years I worked for this house or whatever and. It's the this episode's airing in like eighty nine, and I think he was born in thirty five. So he would be like, yep. he would be like fifty four at the time. So that means he's, <laughs> that means he's been working since he was seven years old. But he just he just always looked old. So like you could cast him for like whatever age and be like, yeah, I guess he's seventy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, even in in Blood Simple, which was before that. Yeah, Blood he looks Simple's fucking like, old. Like the early, like early eighties, like mid, like maybe early to mid eighties. Yeah, he looks old. 
Um, I just yeah, that was the one I, I I gave myself like a handful of movies to watch, and I just rewatched that. And he's like, he's so fucking good in that, and he's sort of like when you think about like the Coen Brothers and stuff, he's like the proto like the prototype for uh, Anton Chigurh. Yes, uh, B- Blood Simple uh, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, uh, no Country for Old Men d- feels like the spiritual sequel to Blood Simple. Although you could say that there are there are crossover. Like it, it also shares a lot with Fargo, obviously. But as a real quick aside, that monologue that he gives in Blood Simple, um, down here, uh, what he says, he says, uh, "Oh, I don't care if you're the King of England, the President, uh, the Pope of Rome." Rome. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then down he, here, it, you're on your own. In te- this is Texas. Yeah, and then he has, then he does like a quick critique of like, I guess like Marxism, where he's like, you know, they say in Russia, everybody pulls for everyone else. They got it all- mapped out. <laughs> everybody pulls for each other else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's that the, that other line when uh, the uh, the bar owner goes to hire him, and he's like, for for some reason he has this like obsession with Russia because he's like, you know, in Russia they only make fifty cents a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a there's a very good band from Texas called Power Trip. The lead singer passed away. I've seen, I've seen them. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, on their album Manifest Decimation, there's a there's a track called Hammer of Doubt, and it opens with M. Emmett Walsh's monologue from Blood Simple, and it goes so fucking. It's like it's it. I, I can't believe they cleared the rights to it, but it's like oh my god, it goes so fucking hard, dude. I it's the perfect out. yeah it's it's very the out al- there's two versions you want them the album version of it it it's it's just mm, i love it so much yeah. but he, him, him in that movie he's such a what i love about his character in that movie is you you aren't expecting the level of evil that he's capable of you know what i mean no, he's not at all he's so charming yes and, 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 he, and almost like a comic relief character yeah, and then he just ends up doing all this wild shit for no reason. For entirely sociopathic reasons. Yeah, that, that's like the baffling, in a lot of their movies they do this, but then it's like such a baffling thing in the movies. Like, he just like flips out and starts like doing this crazy shit, and there's no motivation for why he's doing any of this. Yeah. They, they never offer any sort of explanation as to like why he... He goes through all the effort to like take these pictures and doctor them to make it look like he killed these people. But then he just ends up killing the guy that hired him. And then he goes <laughs> to try and actually kill. Then he goes to like trying to actually kill them. And it's like, why are you doing any of this? I don't. <laughs> and it works. What? It like, works for the movie. But it's like, I'm watching it. Like, I don't understand why he's doing this. Well, other than he's just like, he is, he is just, he's an element like that. He's, he's an Anton Sugar like element. Um, yeah, he's, one just, of he's the, a force of nature. There's yes, there's there's a there's a thing going on around film Twitter right now that it's like a uh, retweet this with an actor's expression that you'll never forget. I, I did that. I, I, I used the OJ from Naked Gun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used Travolta from Blow Up, but what I should have done because it is like burned into my memory. The final shot of Blood Simple, or one of the final shots when he's when he's under the sink. Oh and yeah, he's he... dying, and he's watching the water drop from uh, from the pipe, and he gets this look on his face like he starts to see something, and then the movie ends, and then they play that great four top song. It's just yeah. it's the dude is a fuck. Like even if I was like a huge movie star, you know, I would be fucking intimidated to walk onto set with M. Emmett Walsh, who is a man who is so fucking good at the craft of acting, despite being a horrible little troll, who most people would probably avert their eyes from if they saw him in a diner. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, he's just, he's, and uh, to tie this back into what I was talking about, you know, in the first hour, like without any of like the true, he has some accolades now because like people obviously like he's one of the guys. He's but a to guy. Just, <laughs> to, but, but prior to that, to just be that fucking good at what you do. And to turn in a performance like that is just so fucking badass to me. Dude, to be he, this, to look like that and have the confidence to 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 turn in those performances. That's that's why they're good, dude. It's like it's like the guys who are like the best actors, but they look so fucking weird. That yes, it's, yeah, it's like him and Paul Giamatti and like all these guys, <laughs> the, the fucking guys, dude. 
And yeah. And what's incredible about that scene is like you realize like after she shoots him, like if you haven't been paying attention, you realize like th- they've never seen each other. Like yes. she thinks she thinks it's her husband. And and she's like, Go away, Marty, or whatever. And he's like, Well, ma'am, if I see him, I'll let him know. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, you, and you realize like, oh, they've never interacted. She has no fucking clues in her house right now. Yeah, the fine all she sees, the that final sequence is so wonderfully surreal it it almost doesn't feel like a coen brothers movie uh, just his hand it feels like a lynch movie yes yeah he's he's and it's right after is that after a dream sequence she has about marty uh coming out of yeah he, yeah. she's he, he's at the apartment and he like stands up and like throws up blood everywhere and then she wakes up yes and so the all she knows is like there's a fucking hand that she's stabbed into her windowsill and then those like four shafts of light from where he's he's fired off his pistol, and yeah, it's it's such a yeah. There's definitely it, a lot of like you can see a lot of the influence in this movie. Like there's the, a lot of it does feel kind of like Blue Velvet, which yes. I I don't know if the, they might have did this come out before or after before Blue, uh, Blue Velvet was eighty six because he was doing Dune uh, in eighty four. Oh really? Ooh, yeah. So maybe Blue Velvet drew a little from Blood Simple. It could. I would. I would say that if David, if I thought David Lynch had ever seen more than like seven movies in his life, <laughs> <laughs> there is a cool, uh, like Evil Dead shot in this movie. Uh, well, uh, you be, because it, there's one in um, Raising Arizona too. They really? do. They, they do the Evil Dead when she finds out the babies are gone. They do the demon POV all the way up into the nursery, and she turns around screaming. She looks like that meme of like the little black kid who's like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it's because they uh the Coen brothers and um Raimi uh like work together very closely. Like uh if you ever watch the trailer for Blood Simple, it was they didn't have a movie. It was just a proof of concept. Yeah, and yeah, Bruce Campbell's in it. I want to say the Coen brothers also like they had some hand in like post production on um Evil Dead One or Evil Dead Two. And then that, sorry, I'm fucking spurging right now. That's what the uh, show's about, baby. I can't they, do this with my regular show. Have you ever seen the movie that um, the Coens made with Raby? What is it? Crime Wave. You, no, I've never seen it. Dude, find it. I think it's kind of hard to find out, but find a copy of Crime. The sad thing about Crime Wave is uh, it, there's technically the version that was released. Both parties like kind of disowned it. I, I, I still think it's pretty fucking great. Um, but it is essentially they Bruce Campbell's trying, in it. I've I've heard of this. Yeah, they were trying to make a live action screwball comedy, except with like real violence. So, or not? Sorry, not a screwball comedy. Uh, that's a totally that's like a. They were trying to make like a live action like a Warner Brothers cartoon, but with like actual violence and like you know like criminals and like oh like, like a like a Robert Rodriguez movie. Yeah, yeah, a little bit better than that, but yeah, yeah. Uh, there's this there's this amazing moment in the movie where he the the protagonist of the film the the two escaped convicts have stolen his girlfriend and he flags down a car and he goes he goes please please will you will you will you give me your car I need to save my girlfriend and the old man in the car goes do you love her son and for some reason the camera pans up to the moon and like the score <laughs> swells and the, just pans up to the moon and then pans back down and he gives him the keys it's so funny that's all i gotta check that out yeah you um, like it a lot um but yeah but but yeah blood simple is awesome and yes blood obviously great. he's great in it obviously him and walsh steals the fucking show um you know francis mcdormand obviously i mean she's so hot in this movie she's all I, sweat, sweaty in bed oh it's crazy to realize that like she i think that's her first role i want to say i think so yeah and it's just because she was she was already married I, I i didn't realize like her and joel cohen had been married all that time like yeah they've been together forever yeah um but yeah, this is definitely this. This is Emmett Emmett Walsh's Paris, Texas. This is his fucking his show, dude. Um, and he's yeah, you're right. Is it is like he he's so fucking like he does it. Yeah, he does have that Anton Chigurh thing, where he's so fucking charming, but also like the biggest asshole on the planet, just like a truly yes. evil, terrible person. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I love this movie so much. 
and I, I love the way that like I I, I watched this there uh, I found it on YouTube. It's like an interview with him from the Criterion Blu-ray, and he oh. was like, "Yeah, it's really good." He was talking about how like the the Coen brothers had like reached out to him to be in this movie, and they had like no money, but they you know he's from Vermont, and they wanted him to play this like Texas guy, so he's like, you know, you can kind of tell in the movie like he's trying to figure out how to do a Texas accent. But he's, I mean, he's so charming, like, it doesn't matter that he's not, like, he's not really doing, like, a Texas accent. He's, he definitely sounds like a guy from Vermont. Um, <laughs> but it don't matter. I mean, the uh, night, like, the, the this is bullshit, but, like, the way you could read that is, like, all right, well, this is somebody who's, not, like, you don't actually know where he's from. That what too. is his history? I don't know, like, yeah, I don't know if they ever even established, like, where they are in Texas. Like, it just kind of, they just exist in this, like, nebulous texas idea <laughs> yeah well that's a lot of because they the, the Cone brothers are also what they're like they're where are they from they're not they're not from like texas or like anywhere uh rural but all a lot of their work is like rooted in those like yeah. it's strange it's strange that they're not because they, yeah. they definitely like capture it pretty well they capture rural america really well yeah yeah like you see that in no country you see that in fargo um yeah i don't know they 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 did they know what it's like um and then what's the other one i watched? oh yeah i also i also rewatched house of a thousand corpses oh yeah and, he's in, and that dude that's a movie of fucking guys right there like right off the yeah. bat you got sid hay who's been in there yes and yeah sid Haig, who like it's funny he like uh if you ever go back and like watch the movies that he did with like um Oh God, I'm blank. She's the the famous black exploitation actress. Pam Greer. Pam Greer. He those movies. It's crazy that like those movies like catapulted careers because they are like so insanely tasteless. I feel like people like forget about that. Like when we talk about like like a lot of those people is like now like they're they're seen as like Hollywood uh, legends. It's like you forget that the movies they were in were full of like rape and like lynching. Yeah, and yeah. like like Sid Haig. I think he's saying coffee. He his rolling coffee is like he takes this guy, uh, obviously the guy's black, and he lynches him by like putting a noose around his neck and tying it to the back of his car, and then like drives around really fast in circles saying, "This is how we kill n words." <laughs> it's insane. It's like yeah. I'm I'm watching it just like Jesus Christ, dude. This is so Anthony Cumia would love this shit. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i guess i can see why rob zombie tapped him for this uh franchise <laughs> uh and he i mean he's awesome in it like it it's what he's known for at this point is yeah is captain spaulding but yeah house of a thousand corpses is like kind of a it's not really a good movie but it's it's definitely got some guys in it and by, yeah by the time emmy wall shows up it's like once again he's stealing the fucking show he's doing the Cause like the whole the I mean the movie is basically like a rip off of Texas Chainsaw Two, where yes, and down to I think they even have like I think Bill Mosley from Bill's Mo- Bill Mosley plays yeah the main like Manson guy the yeah. Otis Otis Driftwood who yes. like who like in this movie is like made to be like Marilyn not Marilyn Manson uh, Charles Manson yeah and, and like he. And he looks crazy. Like he's got like this thin, wispy white hair, and he's wearing like these weird contacts, and he's pale and shit. And then in Devil's Rejects, he just looks like Rob Zombie. They completely well, changed. <laughs> well, they they retcon everything in Devil's Rejects because like they also like they also just retcon the fact that like the Doctor was actually like creating he, like the end of House of Thousand Corpses is like they go in underground and they're like mud monsters. Do you yes. remember that? Yeah. Like, I remember what, that. That shit, like they completely ignore that in the in the later movies. Um, yeah, they he kind of he kind of does away with a lot of the like weird sci fi shit that's in this movie, yeah. and just in the in the sequels they turn into like uh, not they're, and they're not even like really framed as horror movies. They're more like road trip action, like just like my like uh, exploitation kind of movies. Yeah. Um. But yeah, in this this movie's definitely just like drawing off of Texas Chainsaw Two, and by yeah, when when M. Emmett Wall shows up, he's like the grandpa character, and he's <laughs> he's so fucking funny in this movie. Like remember the scene when he's like doing stand up? Yes, and, and it's just it's just him doing like 
just like eat like eating pussies like hey, you know, I'm fucking hurt my grandma <laughs> sat on my face like whatever he's saying. <laughs> um yeah, he's he's good as shit in this one. And uh but the, yeah, it's a it's a movie of guys. Goggins is in it. Yeah, oh, oh he is? Yeah, Goggins Goggins plays the like police officer that shows up later in the movie. Oh, I forgot about that. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then Oh, because I'm thinking of the second one. I, my my funny thing with like those with the demented, uh, with like the Firefly family, is like I'm amazed. It is amazing that they don't kill each other because they don't even seem to enjoy each other's company. You know what I mean? No, like, they they're com- completely unlikable characters. They're yeah, not, like they suck, and they don't. Yeah, they don't seem to like each other. And, and there's zero redeeming qualities. They're it's a ba- it's a baffling franchise. <laughs> like when you when you watch when you even when you watch Texas Chainsaw, I was like, I believe that this is a family. I believe that they could like coexist in a house together. And granted, are like you know killing people and and yeah, but so- they they seem to care about each other. There's like a family yeah. dynamic. <laughs> but the Firefly family family is just like. Sometimes the thing about that movie, that movie is like it's so cranked up to eleven that like it does it does make me feel like I'm an autistic kid in a nightclub where I'm just I'm like completely overstimulated by like everything that's going on. It's an insane House of a Thousand Corpses is an insane fucking movie because it's like the whole movie's shot like a fucking music video. Yes, like he he keeps like cutting to these like weird interstitials of like b-roll footage of, of his wife naked and being like the thing about people is you gotta kill them <laughs> and it doesn't i don't, I don't even, it doesn't serve the movie i'm like i don't know what he's doing uh yeah it's uh, you know it's, <laughs> it's a bizarre movie and it's, it, the most bizarre choice is to have a fucking movie led by chris hardwick <laughs> to have like that's your protection and, and, and dwight and yeah, Chris Hardwick and Dwight, where it's like, I mean, good job setting up characters that we were actually like hoping get killed. You know, like, yes, absolutely. Thank, thank Christ this family's going to fucking kill these people. I guess what I'm circling around is, yeah, it is the, the thing that is confused about those movies is that, uh, especially in the second one, Rob Zombie obviously wants you to like, you're supposed to like the Firefly film more than you like the people that they're killing. Right, but he does. He makes the 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 fatal mistake of making them like the most unpleasant people I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah, they 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 suck. And like Sid Sid Haig is good. Like he's charming, but he's not really. But he's not really in House of Thousand Corpses. Not that much. No. Yeah. And but he yeah he is the main like one of the main guys in Devil's Rejects. And then like in the third one he he's like in the beginning and then it's like oh but also he died in prison so. <laughs> We're gonna and they they just replace him with like some cousin that you, you find out about. Oh yeah, Richard Brake, who is good. He's yeah, Richard that Brake. Good. That's another guy right there. He did you see you saw Mandy, right? Yeah. So I know that we keep getting off topic, but just yeah, his his performance in Mandy, where he's so high, where he's so I think you even tweeted something about this. He really portrays being so high that you're able to have a wordless conversation with somebody else who's also on acid. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Like, literally with a look, Nicolas Cage tells him to let the tiger out. And he's like, and he realizes what a monster he's being by keeping this thing in in its cage. Yeah, he's he's a good guy. That's that's an incredible guy right there. One of the all time guys. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I was I tortured myself like rewatching this movie because I realized like oh, I don't actually like this movie. It's terrible. I don't, I don't like House of a Thousand Corpses, <laughs> and I can't believe when this came out that it was presented as though it was like some dangerous piece of cinema. I know. Like, like I remember being a kid, and it was this thing that like everybody was scared of this like dangerous movie, and then you watch it, and you're like, it's just a bad movie. It sucks. It sucks, dude. It's not. It's not scary. It's not particularly funny. It's like it's doing everything wrong. And the like. Honestly, the only saving grace is Emmett M. Walsh's character <laughs> talking about eating his grandma's pussy. Yeah, yeah. Emmett yeah. M. M. Walsh on stage talking about eating his grandma's pussy is like kind of like that in the wraparounds with Sid Haig. Where like Sid Haig's at the beginning. 
and then the scene where they go to the like gas station and then he's like at the end is revealed that he's also part of this family but it is it is such a dark like on like it is kind of because like i hate to say like rob zombie's a shocking guy because i don't think he is but if that is like literally what's going on in his head like it like that like he like he had he conceptualized that entire movie on his own and then shot it exactly the way that he wanted it's like what is like man what is it like to fucking hang out with i bet it sucks i bet <laughs> you think it sucks to hang out with rob zombie yeah i bet i bet literally i bet he's telling those pussy jokes to anybody who's in his immediate vicinity probably well his, it kind of it kind of makes sense like uh, when he knows his backstory like i saw him in an interview like he grew up in a carnival like his parents were carny oh. so he was like working in a carnival as a kid so, and that is like this movie definitely has like the feel of a you know a carnival with a bunch of rides bolted together in the, yes <laughs> you know the, the parking lot of a mall <laughs> just like it, it, it is just like unprocessed trauma yeah just, well, it's yeah. also like kind of an unprocessed movie it doesn't even it doesn't it feels yeah if, if, it doesn't even feel like it's like a finished product it feels it feels like a test screening or like an experiment in filmmaking like i it's so disjointed nothing nothing makes any fucking sense and, and yeah, none, I, of it, I, what, none of it works <laughs> yeah it's funny what and not to turn into like a, not to put on like my fucking thing again but like even in uh, in the devil's reject which which is a an improvement there is a there is like a journey that the characters go on there's there's an arc to those characters i what is the journey of house of a thousand corpses Nothing. besides like the besides the literal like you know this location to this location to the fucking evil basement the it's end. just it's just different set pieces and just weird shit happening like there's no it's 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 very like jarring like shit just like people just move from one thing to the other and there's no reason for any of this to be happening and like which i'm fine with in a lot of movies like i don't think like movies necessarily need like a reason for shit to be happening but this movie doesn't it doesn't establish any characters really yeah. Uh, so there's nobody to care about. Uh, yeah. No. It, it it just does not work. Also, yeah. Wait. Why the hell? And they have like this whole. So like, do they do they kill everybody who goes through the Doctor Psycho ride, or is it only like the un or like? Because you get the impression that maybe they don't. The same way that like, uh, what's Captain Spaulding like, is capable of like having some girlfriends. Like he's like he's capable of being like a semi-functional member of society, right? But but sometimes he goes into like a murderous rage. Yeah, I don't know. There are so many like it's these are not like the kind of questions that like you should be walking <laughs> away from a fucking mutant cannibal movie with. Yeah, I think in this movie they do end up like just killing everybody because like right okay. away, right away they kill Dwight and Chris Hardwick, and right. Then, one of the ladies gets and so like by the by the third act you're following uh it's a, yeah it's, it also does that thing where like you you never know like who the actual protagonist is until like the end like by the end of the movie it's like okay so it's this lady that i guess we're supposed to be rooting for right yeah and, i kind of remember that yeah and so she's like running through like all the underground shit but then in the it, like it ends with her like getting out and captain spaulding is like damn girl what you doing <laughs> and, and she gets in the car, and and Bill Mosley pops up out of the back to stab her. Oh yeah, yeah, Yuck. yeah. It sucks. Those rejects is fun. Like I do like that movie, but the yeah, was, the, yeah. I you it's know better. I I never th you know I know I there's no part of me that thought like you know the guy who sings Dracula was gonna be like a good filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> He, you know, he has he has some good shit every now and then, like scenes or whatever. But I, his movies are always just feel like like a fucking carny made a movie. Yeah, I, he had one. I, I'm sorry, I know I'm so off topic with this shit, dude. Um, it don't matter. It's, it's a celebration of guys. I still, I gotta watch. I gotta watch the monsters. But uh, you know what? Lords of Salem was, I thought, his best movie by by a long shot. Really? Have you seen it? No. Lords of Salem is interesting because it's just, it's Rob Zombie um, attempting to do slow burn, like almost psychological horror, and it, it it it's 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 his most successful movie in terms of images. I I, I I'm the most impressed by it of yeah. all his shit. Yeah, you know you know what what the the movies that are what I 
was hoping Rob Zombie movies would be like because the thing with Rob Zombie movies is they look like they're gonna be like brutal and fucking awesome and just like over the top and crazy and he just kind of drops the ball a lot of the time yes uh like they're, they're not like particularly shocking or even like gory or fun <laughs> necessarily but the uh those the terrifier movies it's like now that's what i'm looking for art the clown yeah art the clown because like that those are fun movies where it's like here's some people that you're not supposed to give a shit about and now we're gonna kill them <laughs> <laughs> i also like that there's no like the the terrifying movies are also a lot less pretentious it's just like it's just like you're here for the kills we know you're here for like practical effects and kills yeah it's it's like the, the goatsy of movies where it's like yo look how fucked yeah. up this is yo isn't this, isn't this fucking crazy that we did this <laughs> yeah that's kind of the spirit of like old trauma movies kind of yeah pretty much and did you see they're they're like remaking the Toxic Avenger? Yes, but I I I kind of have faith in it because um I think Macon Blair Macon Blair who's no, who's another guy, he's the one directing it, um and he's yeah. a he's a great character actor. He's been in uh he's in the a bunch of like Jeremy Saulnier films. Like he's the lead guy in Blue Ruin, and he's dude. Blue... That's that's a fucking good movie. It made for 60k too incredible Dude, that movie like really took me by surprise i love that movie so i i love the thing i love about that movie is um the guy who directed it he directed a movie in 2007 called murder party murder party is it's like a dumb slasher movie uh it's it and it's literally just like kind of like terrifiers just an excuse for like violence and effects it looks very very low budget not a great script to it but i do like that he and then he disappeared for like seven years and then he came back with Blue Ruin, which Blue Ruin, which honestly is like, uh, you know, I would like definitely, you know, kind of adjacent to movies like Fargo or Blood Simple. And yeah. it, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's cool to watch that guy's trajectory. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know his name, but yeah, I love that movie. So, <clears throat> and, and so, I think, I think like Troma is attached to the remake. Like I saw that like Lloyd Kaufman's like one of the executive producers. Well, there's a you know what's funny there. The, 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 Lloyd Kaufman is an interesting guy because I think he has done some of the people who make his movie. I mean, he he might be a, one of the all time grifters, actually, bit of a con man. But um, have oh, you man. ever seen? Have you ever seen? They made one movie with trauma and one movie without uh, trauma. Have you ever seen these movies by this collective called Astron Six? No. They made three actually. So the first movie they made was Father's Day, with trauma. Um, I think you would like it. The villain in it is a villain called the Fuckman, uh, and, he, and he wants to fuck. And there's this great, there's this great, the end of Father's Day without spoil. Well, I'll spoil it anyway. Um, is uh, the Fuckman goes to hell, and so they're like, okay, well, we have to go to hell to kill the Fuckman. So they all commit suicide to go to hell to kill the fuck. They go to hell to <laughs> to kill the Fuckman. They succeed. I think they also kill the devil. And then they're just and then they're just stuck in hell. And they're like, wait, how do we get back? And then the camera just cuts to their dead bodies. <laughs> that rocks, dude. And then the credits roll. They did a they did a great movie you would like called The Editor, which is a send-up of like uh Italian Jala movies. And then they did this awesome movie called Manborg, that's kind of like a parody of like um like Robocop, but it's all done on like low budget green screen. It's okay. very, it's very very funny. Uh, you'd be into all this all this shit, but they uh, they they worked with Lloyd Kaufman, and I think he like conned them out of a bunch of money, and also like just like started like selling merch that they didn't approve of. So he was just like making like huge huge amounts of cash like without their permission, which you know respect. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you, i just remembered something funny i saw do you, do you know that the this comedian in new york uh Fr freddie g freddie goldstein no he's he's this kind of like a tom myers ish figure he's like been doing, been doing comedy forever and he's like i guess like okay at it but it's more like just the spectacle of like who he is is what's funny because he tweeted something like when they released the first poster for it he tweeted something like, so what is the, is this like a, the Toxic Avenger? What is this like a movie about like Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson teaming up or something? It was like something to that degree. <laughs> and, and he like, he had just had no, he had never heard of trauma. 
<laughs> and so in his mind, the joke in his head is like, oh, the Toxic Avengers. So Ben Shapiro and Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I wanted. I wish I could be that blissfully disconnected. <laughs> yeah. ha- have you ever seen um the Toxic Avenger Part Four, Citizen Toxie? Yeah, the one with the Scholar Brothers in it. Yes, dude, the one with the <laughs> one with the Scholar Brothers where they drop the N bomb. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Yeah, I mean, I lit man the the opening of that movie of the. It's literally like a school for like retarded kids. Yeah. And like and they're and they're like they're like shooting <laughs> like it's so they're the diaper gang. That's what it is. Yeah. They're they're a band of criminals dressed as babies with dirty diapers and they're killing retarded kids. Dude, I love I love the thing of like all the guys who like all the people that made their bones as like the alt comics in like recent history have been like been in things or done things where they just drop the in bomb or do blackface. Yes. Like all those guys, like scars. Sarah Silverman, Patton Oswalt, Zach Galifianakis, like all David David Cross was in blackface and Pootie Tang. I know uh, Nick Kroll. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's it's the funny thing about those guys too is to watch them change their tune. like David Cross was like defiantly Zach Galifianakis to his credit has never. And there's actually an interview with him where he uh, they start talking about like cancel culture. He goes, I don't even like to talk about that. He goes, I don't want to give credence to it. I think it's ridiculous. Um, right. but in in a way like in a way like like he doesn't he doesn't apologize for doing that stuff yeah, which is good, which good is for cool. him he should apologize for like most of the movies he's been in <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what man i really i watched dinner for schmucks i was like it is a sweet movie i kind of liked it yeah it's, it's just funny to me that he's like obviously like a brilliantly like funny guy but he's mm-hmm. in dog shit i think he just he wanted he made the money and he was like okay now i can just like live quietly in yeah, South Carolina. Like he was just in one of those uh this new like thing of like biopics about consumer park products. Was it about it, Furbies? It was about Beanie Babies. Beanie Babies. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's it's like the the air or the Tetris or Blackberry, but for Beanie Babies. <laughs> yeah. I, he uh, he seems pleasantly checked out. Like he 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 clearly did what he wanted to do. Yeah, um, he's just getting the bag. He's just, you know, I'll show up in a shitty fucking movie every now and then, make yeah. a few mil, do it between two ferns, and just disappear for a while. It's a shame because I would love to see him in uh, in a dramatic role. He's in this. I know we'll talk about Emmett Walsh again at some point. He's in this kind of crappy. <laughs> he's in this kind of crappy indie movie called uh, Gigantic with um, John Goodman and I want to say Paul Dano. But his role in it is really interesting. He plays a homeless person. I don't think he speaks. He plays a homeless person who is st- like it's it's this indie movie about like guy and a girl they're trying to get together. It's kind of quirky. But underneath all of it, there's this subplot about a homeless person who is stalking the main character and like banging a pipe, like threateningly against him. And it culminates with him eventually attacking and trying to kill him. And the homeless guy is Zach Galifianakis. And nice. um it's just it's interesting. It's this interesting texture in this like otherwise kind of like by the numbers indie movie. What was that movie he did that was like corporate assassins? That had oh, the- you know uh, what I'm talking about? It was it yes. Was like, he was like the wild card character, and it was like an office of assassins that I can't remember, for some reason had to kill each other. And Jeffrey Tambor was one of the main. Uh, I don't know. It wasn't the Belco experiment. It, but that's the yeah, that's the movie I think of when I try to think of this movie. <laughs> Cuz it was cuz I when the Belco experiment came out I'm like, "Oh, they did this one already." Yeah. He, he oh man. And the Belco experiment's good. Is it good? It's, it's really Have you not seen it? Uh no, cuz I was like I've I was like under the impression I'd seen it already. That's a that's another movie of guys, dude. John C. McGinley, Michael Rooker. Uh, Operation Operation Endgame. That's it, yeah. Yeah, he he's in a he was sorry to keep on. <laughs> no, it doesn't movie. matter. I mean, I, you know, how much can we? The the thing about the, the thesis of this show is like trying to center on like a certain character actor, but it's hard to it's hard to talk about him because it's like two it's, it's like three hundred different things they've been in, and a lot of those roles are like five minutes maybe. In, yes, in, like, it's hard to it's hard to like extol in any length on like any one thing because like. He he was you know Emmett Walsh was the star of Blood Simple, but then like 
something like Fletch, he's just like the doctor in that one scene. <laughs> yeah, I was because that's actually a good point. Has he has he he hasn't starred in any other movies? Even like Harry Dean Stan just had one that he starred in called Lucky before he died. Right. But I think I think that's the only time. And to even call M. Emmett Walsh the star of Blood Simple is kind of a generous characterization. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's it's sort of like that Anthony Hopkins thing where he's maybe not like in the movie a whole lot, but he steals the show. Yeah, he. I'm trying to think of other movies that obviously Blade Runner. That he's he's incredibly memorable in the he's in the, good in that he's good at raising arizona um he's in raising arizona yeah he plays like a like a mechanic or something oh yes right right in the beginning yeah 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 he's he's in he's there's a good episode of x files he's in that's really good um the the interesting thing about him he because he was in he played john goodman's dad in gemstones and the the funny thing about that is that, that interview I watched from the Criterion Blu-ray from Blood Simple is he was talking about like how early on the Coen brothers really liked using him until they discovered John Goodman. And, oh, and oh, then man. he was like, and then I was out of the Coen rotation. He was like, yeah, that's fine with me. <laughs> but then he was like finally in a, a show with John Goodman to the worlds collided on Gemstones. <laughs> and he's, he he's, he's awesome in that show, the, the couple episodes he's in. I've got a. I watched. I I haven't watched Gemstones. I have watched a couple episodes, but I got to catch up on it. Oh yeah, in the second season, they do these like flashbacks to when uh, John Goodman's character was like starting out as a a grifter televangelist, <laughs> and his dad is like this demented old pre like retired preacher who's like suffering from dementia. So he's like, "You're a fucking pussy, Eli. I fucking hate you." <laughs> And then, and then he's just sitting on the bed, like blank face, and he's like, "I love you, son." And then John, <laughs> John Goodman's like, "I love you, Dad." And then he, and then Walsh looks at him, and he's like, "Fuck you!" It's <laughs> it's so funny. I've seen the obviously I've seen Misbehaving, obviously, so I assume obviously. it's like that same timeline. Uh, yeah, the show the show like does bounces back and forth throughout each season. There'll be there's like in the show there'll be like whole episodes that are just flashbacks. The, like focus on this like one time period like they did one in this this season that was really funny that's like a flashback to like maybe the late 90s early 2000s and uh danny mcbride's character like whoever the kid is, is playing him is just like full-on wigger like full-on <laughs> like new like new metal wigger <laughs> that's then, so fucking awesome yeah like there's a line where he's in the kitchen talking to his family he's like man it's all about the he says she said bullshit <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a good show it's I, a- I'm, I'm gonna as soon as we're done with uh, our justified rewatch we'll, we'll move on to that oh yeah and yeah and it, my, my man it's the dude danny mcbride knows how to use guys because it's uh the same season that M. Emmett Walsh is in, one of the main like secondary characters that's like drives the plot in that season is um Eric Roberts. Yes. Eric Eric Roberts, who also like is who will who literally sometimes does YouTube fan movies. Like Eric Roberts will be, if you raise enough money, he'll be in your Batman fan film. Yeah, he Eric he'll, Roberts he'll has it. a really fun career because it's like He's in the Nolan Batman movies, and then he's just on some like lifetime bullshit. <laughs> he's in like a Kurt Cameron movie or something. I mean, I do, and I I, I respect those guys too because plenty of those guys are like still like you know, it's th- there are guys who do that who somehow don't devalue um, themselves. Mickey Rourke is one. Like yeah. I like I do like Mickey Rourke. Will, Mickey Rourke is in this movie, this Jack Nicholson movie called The Pledge. Um, that's a great movie uh directed by wild man sean penn the, the my favorite actor right now sean penn dude sean penn's awesome dude sean, i like the like the difference between new and old hollywood oh let me see if i can find this i dude, got you're actually, probably about to say exactly what i said to robbie about this well but, i just what it was was i had two i took two screen chests because i had like two things shared in my feed at the same time fuck let me see if i can find this shit Right. So the first story on my feed from discussing film, Michael Sarah responded to a meme on Scott Pilgrim on the Scott Pilgrim cast email chain nine years after it was sent. 
Chris Evans said, he just said, oh, that's funny. I responded like, Michael, what the fuck are you responding to this email from nine years ago for? That's a modern Hollywood celebrity story. That's what they, that's something, that's a story you tell on late night now. Sean Penn is threatening to rape your daughter in VR <laughs> and shoot Russian soldiers with his melted down Sean Oscar. Penn's trying to do like a Black Mirror episode. Yes, dude. <laughs> Sean Penn, Sean Penn is like, that's the spirit of the kind of celebrities we used to have. We used to have Dennis Hopper going up to George Cukor at a dinner party and threatening to bury him alive. Like we used to have real stars, not fucking people. not, not, oh my God, Michael Sarah sent the funniest meme in the email chain. Go fuck yourself, dude. Oh yeah, we used to have Rip Torn breaking into a bank. <laughs> <laughs> another guy, another guy right there. Another, a great, a guy who... It's some of the some of the rip torn movies. I mean, he, even the trifecta of like Freddy got fingered, defending your life, the man who fell to earth. I mean, such a wide spectrum of genre and tone, and he nails every single one. Oh yeah, he he was he's another guy that's just like anytime you see him, it's like, well, I'm happy. This is like, yes, he, I mean, he was the like the. I mean, I don't know. Everybody on Larry Sanders was great, but he, everything he did on that show it was just fucking hilarious. He was, he's so good in that. <laughs> he, I mean, even just like his delivery in Freddy Got Fingered, which that movie is like, that movie is so perfectly constructed that it, it's like talking about the pyramids. Honestly. I've actually never seen it. I, I know I I know I need to. I know. It's, oh my, Dalton. I've done a disservice to myself. <laughs> you got to do that today, dude. <laughs> I, I'm you know, not maybe, kidding. Maybe, maybe me and Robbie should do a Freddy Got Fingered uh, appreciation podcast. <laughs> Re- I mean, really, like, Freddy Got, F- Freddy Got Fingered is a movie that even in, like, just to describe the opening to you, Gord, he wakes up, he's late, he gets on his skateboard to meet his family at the train station, or at the bus station. He skateboards through it, like, instead of going straight there, he takes a detour, like, through a mall, he, like, skateboards through a mall, is chased by like a mall security guard uh skateboards all the way to the bus station where his family is waiting for him in the family car they like they all came from the same house he could have ridden with them and then they give him he, he they give him bus tickets to get on a bus to go to california before he can get on the bus they surprise him with a brand new car to drive to california himself with. so none of it needed to happen it's like the most it is and that is like the kind of like idiocy that just like defines the movie none of this needed to happen you didn't need to meet here this could have happened at home why did you buy bus tickets why did you go through the mall it's so fucking perfect i gotta watch it yeah, it's I, fantastic I, I know i know it's good everybody says you gotta watch this and I just, i've never actually seen it rip torn the shit that rip torn says the way that rip torn verbally abuses tom green in that movie and you get the impression that maybe he didn't even enjoy being in the movie that much like some of it feels so <laughs> genuine yeah <laughs> i love oh that my God. it's fucking the, awesome the actor who's like begrudgingly starring in a movie <laughs> <laughs> well because why like literally like you're like why you know this guy he, he is like a i think he's like classically trained for him to be in this like is kind of insulting <laughs> yeah like that did you ever see that interview with Bob Hoskins talking about the Mario Brothers movie? It's amazing. <laughs> it's like, so... I used to I used to be in King Lear. <laughs> I asked King Lear. So, I didn't even I didn't even know it was a game. Then one of my sons who shows me his little so go out jumping up and down. I said, fuck. I used to be in King Lear. <laughs> you know, whatever the fuck he says. He was drunk every day on that shoot. Yeah, I heard that him and Lee Wazamo <laughs> were just getting fucking hammered. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy he's British. John Leguizamo, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> you don't expect it. Yeah, you don't expect Leguizamo to actually be British. And you hear him talking in an interview. It's like, whoa, they have Puerto Ricans in Britain? Bob, Bob Hoskins another one of the guys. Another one of the He's ultimate guys. one of the guys, yeah. There's a, you ever seen The Long Good Friday? No, I haven't. Long Good Friday. Bob Hoskins plays like the head of like the, the, the British mafia on Good Friday. The Is British it, mafia. This one with Ice Cube and Chris Tucker? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> look at these layabouts yeah uh no it's they're trying to they're trying to make a deal with the they're trying to go in on a business deal with the italian mafia oh yeah and, and, oh, and, oh i just remember this is like a tangent but it, please, it please. made me laugh so hard today have you seen 
what the like people on Twitter are doing to replace the N word. No, like what they're what they're saying in place of the N word now. Like what? Because that, vi- that video. Have you seen the video of those two guys running over that dude on the bike? Yes, that's insane. Yeah, so it's a- this is where I became aware of it because like all these different like blue check accounts, they're calling them scholars. <laughs> they're like, look at these two scholars murdering this dude. <laughs> <laughs> I can at least like appreciate like okay it's like they're, like the irony isn't entirely racist <laughs> like, you know, I can appreciate the creative angle on it's, it it's so good it's like, I like that dude <laughs> that is something that I could see not being racist if a million people weren't doing it you know what I mean like if, right. like if a guy if a guy offhandedly referred to two criminals as scholars like I say oh yeah I can you know yeah tr- true they aren't it's you like the, the, the logical evolution of, of low information voters. <laughs> now, now they're scholars. <laughs> yeah. Va- uh, uh, what's what's the low vaccine compliance? That's the other one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were we were at karaoke. Vaccine one. hesitant, I believe, is actually what it is. Vaccine yeah. hesitant. We were we were at karaoke one night and uh I think I was I was singing uh fellas in Paris. Yeah, <laughs> and, and when it when it got when it got to the line, I was like, "I got my low information voters in Paris." Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Uh, but uh, yeah, but yeah, what's what's back on I for, point? Uh, I forget what I was saying. What's great about the guys, you know, the guys, Emmett Walsh, whoever it may be, is the I have more respect for them. Than like a Daniel Day Lewis, where it's, it's like he's a guy like movie stars like that who are like really precious about it. Where it's like, I'm only going to be in seven movies, and each one's going to take like four years to make. You know, yeah. it's it's like okay, you know, so you're not you're not like a working actor then. You're gay, you know. Yes, and the, yeah. and the fucking the fucking guys are like, I'll be in everything and just knock it out of the park every time. And the movie. May or may not be dog shit, but I'll tell you what, I'm showing up. And I'm yeah, at- it, it, it's funny. There's a there's it's why I like Al Pacino. Because I think Al Pacino actually goes into roles with a character actor mindset. Where he's like, like, like he, Jack and Jill. Yes. And and <laughs> which which he literally like I tell people to watch that movie for him. He's so good. And that when he's he he, I I've never seen it, but I, I've seen the like the Dunkachino sequence. <laughs> tip tip of the iceberg okay tip of the iceberg there is an amazing scene where he is doing he's doing richard the third on broadway with for some reason bruce jenner <laughs> bruce jenner is like also and he gets he stops to take a phone call in the middle of the performance <laughs> it's like and, then, and he's just he just stops richard uh richard the third to take this phone call and his understudy comes out and like offers to take over and he goes he goes go away nobody wants to see you <laughs> and it's like it's 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 great and it, but he he literally even said he's like i sometimes i like to say yes to bad movies to see if i can make them better mm-hmm. which i love i love like, that yes. i have more respect for that than any any christian bale or any of these fucking twerps just being yeah. being everything and just show show these motherfuckers what's up yeah <laughs> no that that and that is like that's the true mark of like uh, uh even um the fuck uh the guy from mr blonde and reservoir dogs um michael madsen michael madsen yeah michael madsen's great michael madsen like there was an interview somebody like kind of bluntly like asked him about his filmography and he was like well the, the point of being an actor is to work so i like to work yeah i get it you know that's uh, like and that's i mean that's the thing is like the, the dr- my dream job honestly is to be a fucking guy i would love to be a guy just be yeah. a guy who shows up well, you're like, yo, who is this guy? I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. Like, you definitely hey. have the the look for it. That's a that's one way of describing yeah. my look. Yeah, I'm trying to be nice. Yeah, you have a, you have a, <laughs> you have a face for a character actor. <laughs> yeah, you have a, you have a memorable you have a memorable face, not a memorable name. Right, the ultimate curse. The ultimate. <laughs> uh, yeah, it seems it seems like a good gig because you always you always get to work and like everyone. Whether they know who you are or not, they respect you, like, subconsciously. Yes, because you you're know. from the TV. Yeah, well, yeah, that there is that. But it's also, like, with with any of, the, like, the guys, is they, they're always, like, so good at what they do. 
it's like a lot of people like have no clue who these people are like i mean there was a documentary about this actually yes <laughs> so we're just doing that i guess but <laughs> uh but yeah it's, it's like most people have no clue who these people are but they're always like good in what they do like I, i've seen like clips of young sheldon where it's like ed begley jr and wallace sean in a scene together yeah and it's like well this is great <laughs> i've never seen this show but i like this <laughs> Yeah, it's it's almost it's almost enough to make you watch it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's like uh, I think there they they there are like anecdotes about this too of people being like character actors being approached by people who like who don't know who they are but they want a picture. You know, they have to ask them what they've done, but they but they they want the picture first. Yeah, or not not ask them what they've done. They know what they've done, but they they have to like ask them their name. Yeah, that's the that's the allure of the silver screen is just like oh I've seen you in something. And I have no idea why you're famous or who you are, but let me get a picture with you. Yeah, dude. Yeah, people that is are, the, yeah. They're idiots. They're they're stupid. They're fucking um, morons. And I guess being on TV now doesn't even mean anything. It means shit. <laughs> especially especially money wise. Like what like call like Colum got a tonight show spot and he's still like working at a moving company. Oh, uh Colm Terrell? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was, I mean, I know a guy who got a Tonight Show spot uh, in like 2015, but this guy who, I, the, I, the, I sorry, the way that I'm framing this makes it sound like I'm uh, denigrating Colin, Colin, that's not what I'm trying to do, but I'm saying like that, it just doesn't, I knew a guy, this guy, Randy Syfax got a Tonight Show spot in like 2016, he was like a DC comic, um, I'd only ever seen him do like 10 minutes of material, and he did five of those 10 minutes on the Tonight Show, that was at that point already like, you know, 10, 11 years old. And I think, you know, it didn't, it doesn't change anything for you anymore. No. That's yeah. not where you build a, that's not where nobody's going to, nobody's going to check you out at the the Funny Bone because you did a Tonight Show set. Yeah. And I mean, we're not the first people to make this observation. It's just, what a sad state of affairs. Well, but it is like, so there are so many comedians, it's late night's dead now, so it's kind of over. But like, I was talking about this with my buddy Pierce when I was in New York. Cause I would have this with a lot of comics in LA where they're like, they would be so bitter. They're like, Oh, if I could just get on the tonight show, I think or if I could just get on late night, things would, I know things would change. And it's like, no, it wouldn't. But that is just like a Freudian. Like the only reason you want to do that is because it's an accomplishment. Your parents will understand. Yeah. That is what, that is why so many people want that. And it's, and it's like, I guess it's like a credit. So it, I, it might help you get booked at like a loony bin or something. Maybe. But even those places, even like a loony bin is like check, they're they're booking like people with podcasts now. Yeah, you, know? you can also just lie, just like do the thing where it's like, yeah, I've been on Fox and Sirius XM and yeah, like, what, like, and who's gonna check that? I was on Letterman. They took it down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I've seen so many comics whose like credits are just these nebulous. They just name a network. Where it's like I was on Sirius. Like, the, well, okay. the, what the? Do you remember there was that Steve Hofstetter show? I think it was called Laughs. Laughs on, on Fox, Fox, yeah. That was that was big in Dallas. That was like a I, thing everybody was trying to get on. Well, they show like 20 seconds. Like if you're on Laughs, you're on Laughs for 20 seconds. It's the it's the equivalent of a of what tick Instagram reels are now for comedy, but it was broadcast on like a network. Um and I I there was a there was another comic in DC who got on Laughs and he literally thought he was like he was like he said to me his words were I'm going to ride this thing all the way to the top. <laughs> and then you watch it, you watch it and he's, you know, it's a 15 second joke that he told that you, you don't even have enough time to really like memorize his name. Uh, there was a guy in Dallas who just had a tweet featured on the show and, that, <laughs> and then he used that as a credit. Like I've been on laughs on Fox. Um, I, and you know, that's the, I guess that is the respectable grift. Steve, I mean, Hofstetter, great grifter. Just yeah. Fucking. I would love. Dude, I would love to go to one of his shows and do like do heckle do heckles that he didn't plan for. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is he still doing that? Is he still doing the comedian destroys heckler? Uh I would be surprised if he suddenly developed a really good hour of material. But uh I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And wasn't wasn't the big like controversy with laughs on Fox was it like he just was not paying anybody? Yeah, no, but it was it was basically like uh it was essentially like a crowdsourced network tv show dude he's a, yeah hofster is such an interesting guy because he's like the most successful version of 
the like the guy who runs a bringer show yeah yes you know what i mean it's it's like that same kind of guy who somehow like made it onto rogan it's <laughs> it's crazy yeah, maybe I'll just go to like I'm gonna go to a Steve Offsetter show and just like accuse him of rape from the audience or something. Yeah, I mean he gives off that vibe. He's another guy that's like if any accusations came out, I'd be like, yeah, I can see that. Oh, is he pivoting to like? Uh, is he pivoting to like TED Talk almost? Oh, maybe. No, there was one. There was one comedian who did that. Um, oh God. Who was it? I was shocked when I checked in with this guy to realize that he's literally just a motivational speaker now. Cause he had like, he had two, it was Kyle. Oh. Cease. Kyle Cease. Kyle Cease yes. is a, yes, he's a, he's a Ted talk. He's like a motivational speaker now. So insane. Yeah. Do you remember that early, early Stanhope joke? I don't even know if he ever did on an album where he's like, yeah, I blew a speaker in my car today. Was a motivational speaker. <laughs> uh, shout out to everybody! Check out Doug Stanhope. <laughs> wow, Kyle C's had a had a had an had an album that reached number nine on like the comedy charts. Oh uh, well, that happens. Like every That's true. Lo- every like local comedian everywhere will like record an album and then it'll hit the like number one on itunes so there'll be like a day or two where it's like them and then number two jim gaffigan and then and then it goes back to gaffigan right and no and nobody ever actually listened to the fucking album that's one that's i guess what you know we're back we're talking shop there's only a thousand of us but uh (laughs) that's one of the craziest things about seeing like local or like amateur comedians who haven't like made it necessarily where it'll be like people who have like maybe a thousand followers on Twitter, Instagram, and they've been doing open mics forever. And may and maybe they MC and feature every now and then. And then they just like record an album. And they don't they don't yeah. have a, they don't have any sort of presence. Like they don't have a podcast. They don't like nobody really knows about them, but they've been in their like local scene forever. So they'll like record an album at like the club they've been going to for the last decade. And, and sink all this like money and effort into this thing, and then like no nobody fucking listens to it. it, it it's it's I had an ex- there was a local guy, and actually it, it's a shame because I do actually think he's an incredibly funny comic, and I don't know why he's not doing well because his whole thing was like crowd work. He would be thriving in in today's like Instagram climate, but there was this great comic in Baltimore, Jason Weems, this fantastic comic, and he would sell. He recorded a DVD. And he would sell it after shows. And we were both on a show. We were on a show together. I was like friends with this guy. We like, we're not friends, but like, you know, we're friendly. We're comics in the scene together. And it was kind of lightly attended. Um, and so after the show, just to support him, he had all, he like set up all his DVDs. I'm like, yo, Jason, I'll buy a DVD from you. And he goes, oh, thanks so much, man. And he goes, hey, here, let me sign that for you. I'm like, he like signed it for me and took a picture with me. It's like, dude, I, I, I featured for you. 30 minutes ago like what are you doing man <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting like yeah comedy ruins lives it just ruins people's lives <laughs> it, it's just it's a weird it's a strange mindset to get it and some people really just like get into like the i don't know they get very set in their ways and like what the what the uh what the path for making it is these guys yeah. it's like gotta have my gotta have my shirts gotta have my dvds yeah it ruined my life i got into textiles you know i know ruined I my life yeah but yeah it was that was like i guess like a manic thing i, I don't know i don't know why that was happening <laughs> so i look back on it and it was like well i did everything wrong in doing that <laughs> yeah and, and it just i it just making myself look like a fucking ass trying to unload these shirts and i guess you know, after the events that did transpire, it was like, maybe I was just losing my mind. <laughs> it is. I mean, look, it is cool to, uh, it is, it is cool to put all of your, 
to have all of your assets be in t-shirts is definitely i mean it's something to say for sure <laughs> yeah, to be like will smith in pursuit of happiness but with t-shirts <laughs> really? like, babe i gotta sell these shirts <laughs> we're gonna lose the apartment if i don't sell these shirts <laughs> just like just racing to catch a taxi with with t-shirts with sonic <laughs> smoking weed flying out of your suitcase <laughs> It was, it's the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> or one, one of the dumb. I mean, I've done a lot of dumb shit. But that was, it was so stupid to be like, I'm going to spend all this like time and money like getting artwork and making. And it was, it was a, like, it was stuff that I thought looked cool at least. But <laughs> looking back, I'm like, this is so fucking stupid. So funny, dude. Yeah. Literally, like, fuck it, like, <laughs> just just eating t-shirts to sustain yourself in the winter. Yeah, just, just to, to have a podcast that has, like, maybe 4,000 subscribers and be like, well, mm-hmm. it's time to really sink all of my... Uh... <laughs> it's time to get all... <laughs> it's time to go all in on merch, baby. <laughs> yeah, we need to get all wings of this operation up and functional. Don't, yeah, that's and fucking don't even have a website. Don't understand the business of even fucking doing this. Like you, you have to, if you want a t-shirt, you have to find me geographically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's selling them through Venmo and Cash App. <laughs> oh my god, Dalton, that's was, psychotic, dude. It was so stupid. <laughs> yeah, that'll be that'll be a black mark on my uh, credit report and just overall history forever. This is the time, <laughs> the, the time that I really. <laughs> all of my you know i would i would have been better served like buying an nft or something <laughs> yeah or you would have you literally because there's at least like there would be like an apparatus behind that to like you know there's at least some kind of guarantee that like <laughs> it is worth something and people the funny thing is like people did like the merch but mm-hmm. then like looking back on it like i crunched the numbers and i'm like there was never a chance that I was going to make money on that. No, definitely not. There, like even if even if like I kept selling out of these things, what the the like what the initial investment was it was like I'm never going to I was never going to make my money back on that. How large how large was the batch? Um I think like the first time I did it it was like 60 shirts and like okay, 20, that's tw- like 20 posters and I sold out. And so I was like, Oh, this is working. So I like did another order. Well, did you, did you make a profit on the first on 60? I sold them all, but there was no profit considering like what was invested. Really? That's so, yeah, I would th- like okay. in, in, in terms of like what I like paid for the artwork and like the actual materials right. and, and like everything shipping and all that. It's like, there was just no chance that it was ever going to turn a profit. So it's like one of the stupidest things I've ever done. And what did you what did you sell them for? Uh I think I was selling them for like 25. Okay. Like the shirts were like 25 bucks. Um and people were buying them. Like people seemed to like them. It was just like I just didn't know what I was doing. I was just I was like it was like during the pandemic and I didn't realize I was like losing my mind anyway. So yeah. I was making a lot of like really manic decisions. Like I had this idea in my head that I was going to like start uh like an e-commerce business out of my apartment. <laughs> I was like, I'll get a Shopify account, I'll get like a digital scale, and I can I can run a whole fucking clothing company out of my apartment. Oh yeah. Lots of moving and shaking going on in those days, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, dude. <laughs> it's a, definitely a lot of locomotion. Yeah, and, and yeah, then no. and then that that evolved into like I think I have a Vanna syndrome. I think the CIA gave me a Vanna syndrome and I need to go stalk the streets of New York. <laughs> That's it's, awesome. It it would be like go drop off a shipment of shirts and then go harass a small business as to, about their mask policy. I would Havana syndrome sounds not. It sounds like it should be like a nice thing. Yeah, it sounds like you're drinking like something out of a coconut. But yeah, it sounds like you just like. It sounds like it's like. <laughs> it sounds like a like a Jimmy Buffett disease. Yeah, that's what he died from. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, yeah, Jimmy Buffett died from a Vanna syndrome. syndrome. His, his, yeah. vi- his vibes were too chill. He had too good of a time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, that, that was... Sucks, I, I, I legitimately, for months, like, I was trying to figure out what was going on with me. Mm-hmm. And, and I landed on, like, I think I've been hit with a direct energy weapon and now I have a Vanna syndrome. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it it happens more than you would think. 
for sure and especially and especially to you there's yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a, lo- a long list of good reasons why they would want to target that experimental technology yeah. on you specifically he's getting too good at shirts yeah he's if we don't stop him he might he might order a batch of a hundred shirts if we don't get him under control he's gonna put yeah. sheen out of business <laughs> this dalton pruitt kid's about to turn 30 dollars profit what do we do <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. there was at one point I I think where I came to the conclusion was that for Halloween one year I had done a character called Violent Jay Leno so I was in full jet like Juggalo makeup <laughs> and so there were pictures of me on the internet as, as this like Juggalo character and the Juggalos mm-hmm. were like officially a gang according to the FBI so yes. there was like evidence of me being in a gang therefore the like the the three letter agencies were surveilling me and like onto my case yes, yes. because i was a juggalo <laughs> because they hate the, the three letter agencies are they're most fearful of the ultimate three letter agency the icp <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah they 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 were they poisoned the fago yeah, <laughs> they tainted the Fago. We're giving people the rock they put the, fluoride in the Fago, dude. The rock and rye was giving people a Vanna syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, and yet the the only mm-hmm. the only merch I'm doing now is an upfront scam. I made a telemarketer's documentary style decal. Oh and really? Was, yeah, and so I just did it all through Patreon. So it's like Patreon will do like take care of the merch, but. It, they only they only send the shit out after like three months of being subscribed. So I just tell people like, this is a scam. But I, please right. d- please do this. Please spend seventy five dollars on a sticker. People that I found the people that I mean the, the fact it's like I think I said at the beginning of this they're probably just supporting you because they like you, dude. You know yeah I mean, you yeah. Like, you can just be upfront. Yeah, I mean I get it. I guess I guess people do actually like want to see me like be healthy and succeed. It's just. Like nobody's nobody's putting up with nobody's nobody is like you know Dalton's okay but he's st- I'm in it for the stickers you know like <laughs> yeah that was the yeah that was the thing with the shirts and the posters was I think like I think a lot of people were like why is he doing this <laughs> this, <laughs> this is so stupid um oh, I don't man. know I just really want to do I just fucking have a passion for merch dude yeah <laughs> love merch <laughs> even even though like me personally i would never fucking wear a shirt for a podcast <laughs> i know that is the that is like kind of like the the crazy thing about it right like, like the i'm always appreciative when like people are like uh have been like a fan of like the thing that i've done and i, I even i'm a fan of podcasts you know but i've never understood like wanting to uh i guess i do it for bands i guess i guess when you don't do the thing it's more appealing to like wear an emblem of it Sure. You know, on <laughs> yourself i i guess like i guess that i could see or you just be but, like um, Lu- like lewis and your entire wardrobe is like legion of skank shirts well yeah you could be like that <laughs> <laughs> just, all, just, all, just always be advertising your show <laughs> i would i would uh, I, I mean I, I would strongly urge people not to be like that but you could that you could certainly do that yeah well, also, he's, Lewis he, seems. I don't want to shit again. I don't want to shit on Lewis. I don't mean. To I'm not shitting on. He he's he's like an exceptional businessman. Like he knows what he's doing. Yes, yeah. is he? Though yes. I mean, like it. But isn't like isn't isn't gas digital like fraught with problems and and not that profitable? I have no. That's why he's a good businessman. Is like because you have no idea. You have no idea. Yeah, he's he's the the te, he's like the Ted Sarandos of podcasting. It's like, but I know about it, so certainly like it must not be that like to you know. I mean like, whatever. I, I don't. Again, I like, have I have no clue what's going on with that company. I don't know like where the money's coming from or like how much money they're possibly making. I I, right. I don't I don't understand like why part of the problem is the show that's making the most money on the network um right yeah like i none of it makes any sense to me i just i just like having spent time with lewis and interacting with him like i he he definitely is like a born salesman like he understands sales and business and stuff so i don't know he seems to know what's what he's doing interesting i guess yeah i, I mean i guess I, I guess he literally must be. i guess like the proof is in the pudding of like it's like it's it has sustained itself for this long it didn't fail 
yeah he's just such a, he's such an interesting guy to me he, yeah hey, he, the, if anything he's interesting <laughs> he's a, he i mean more like i guess the vibe is more like uh like a born used car salesman yeah it's like like him and tim dylan like these kinds of guys where it's like they're, they're like re, like real estate agents who became entertainers yeah it's really fascinating to me that is definitely yeah yeah because where they excel at more than anything is just being like a businessman in you convincing know? you that you want to in convincing you that what they have is worth checking out yeah because like i think like lewis to his own admission would like admits that he's not like a particularly gifted comedian but he's really good at like the art of the deal you know you the, love, like, i do the, I love, I love the good. art of the deal. I love the art of the deal. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's why Trump. I guess that's why Trump is like the best comedian. Yeah, that. Well, yeah, there's a book. I my buddy Clint had this book that I think is like out of publication, but it was it was called something like the comedian as confidence man or comedian as con man, and it's it's just all about how like the true like art of being a stand up comedian is just being a con man. And Damn. I do agree with that. It's like it, it is like a total con job. Yeah, you know you're right. Free free Hassan Minaj. Free, I mean, yeah. Free, free him. Free, free him. Hassan Minaj. We got to protect Russell Brand. We got to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The two Indian men of comedy. Yeah, because I, I mean, it's it's like more than any other like quote unquote art form. It's it's like with music or painting or whatever. There's like a like a tangible, I, I, I guess, like art to that. You know what I mean? Whereas, like with comedy, it's like you're you're basically just like selling chicken fingers and cocktails in a, in a mall, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it is it is like a, a, a like a confidence thing, and then it, I guess if you're good enough at it, you can do theaters. Like, you know what I mean? It's it's like very rare for a stand up comedian to reach the level of like what anyone would consider an artist. Yes, like that's most the exception. Yeah, that's most of them are just like. It's just brazen fucking confidence, and and it's you know, and it's like, oh, I, Brendan Schaub is coming to town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Although even, yeah, I mean, even Brendan Schaub, like, he was good. He was kind of good at something before stand up. Sure, and then he pit. You know, he pivoted. He pivoted. You gotta, you gotta pivot. You do need to pivot. <laughs> I don't even always like I I go in and out of like understanding the hate against that guy because I find him like I find him bad in a kind of like inoffensive way. I'm just like, yeah, this is like this is this is a, to go back to like this is like passable in like a Miami club. They're definitely worse comics to me. Sure. But but I, I mean know. he's he's fun to hate because he I mean he does suck. He does <laughs> suck. He's he's but he's also just like a fun figure to like gawk at and be like. What what is this? What I think is- I think I think that people have an unconscious. I I think that like part of it. I don't think people have realize how much you should be attributing to this. But he does have like a cleft palate, right? Like he ha- he does have like the like the hair lip. Yeah, a, I, lo- a lot of MMA guys have that. Well, but it's not a, it's not a, what's the but it's not you don't get it from fighting. Like that's like a birth defect. No, but I guess like being retarded makes you become like want to <laughs> become a fighter, you know? Like yeah, you get a complex <laughs> about it. And I do think I do think people I think that I think that I genuinely have this theory that like people with cleft palates, people are just looking for permission to hate them and I think that that's what Brendan Shaw is doing. Like I think that you you start with not liking the lip and then the bad comedy is just an excuse to like really go in on the guy. Sure. But that's a wild theory that I have about like the human reaction to the cleft palate lip. Right. It's something I've observed in myself. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody on Twitter, somebody on Twitter made me laugh the other day talking about like, and I, I've had the same thought about how like on Rogan's podcast, when he goes into those like deep dives about like the craft of comedy and, yeah. all that is someone on twitter was like it's it's interesting how like he'll he'll go into talking about this stuff and be like have like really insightful things to say about like what stand-up is and the writing process and all that but then what like you watch a stand-up and it's the biggest pile of dog shit it's horrible <laughs> it's so bad dude it's it's unreal because i've had that same thought like on that show he actually does have like a lot of kind of like worthwhile things to say about like the actual craft of it and 
like how it works and the writing process and creativity in general. And then he goes out on stage and he's like, you guys ever eat a fucking edible? <laughs> <laughs> the, only, the only Rogan joke I remember is when he hosted live at Gotham on Comedy Central. And he come and there's actually like a way that this could be funny, but he come, it almost feels like a Pete Holmes bit. He comes out on stage and the first thing he says is, uh, you guys ever remember space? What about all that shit? <laughs> he starts like pointing at <laughs> You guys ever remember that space is above us all the time? <laughs> Dude, I, I love that shit so much where the, the, the pseudo philosophical intellectual thing of being like, damn, dude. Space is crazy. You guys ever think about space? <laughs> it is. I mean, and like, you know, listen, to, fair point. It is nuts. I don't I mean, like thinking about space. Fair point. Space is fucking crazy. Dude. Fair point. Space is crazy. Yeah. Fair, fair point. I and literally nobody else fully understands it. So, yes. <laughs> fer, fertile premise, Joe Rogan. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like these guys are just like overthink things where it's it's like, yeah, if you spend enough time like thinking about anything, you're you're gonna land on just the like, oh yeah, I guess this doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, so, you know what I mean. Like, it's not like a, a novel idea that like life doesn't make sense. <laughs> I tried do. to I tried to do like a goof on that kind of thing. I was trying to do like this kind of ironic bit for a while, where I was like, it was like a Pete Holmes style bit where it's like, uh, can you believe we named all the birds? That's real. Think of all the birds you've ever seen. We caught them, named them. I was like, it was very like Dane Cook, Joe Rogan. Dude, I love that. We didn't I, ask them what their names were. We named them. Oh, I, I mean, that that does that does sound like a bit of his. Like that, uh, that would be something he would do. Maybe I'll start doing it for real. Dude, <laughs> I, I hate it so much when comedians try to be like intellectuals <laughs> Yo, know. dude, just be just be a clown you're not slavyov slavyov zuzek <laughs> you're not you're not slavyov who just died apparently i, I saw on did Twitter. he die he, i no, saw he, that he didn't he didn't there was somebody somebody posted that and i mean it's it is the most believable lie i think i've ever read but yeah did you did you see that when when that uh the it, it TikTok NBC thing was blowing up. Somebody made one with him, where it's like no. him going, him going like, "Yes, yes, ice cream so good. Uh, yes, yes, hot dog <laughs> yummy, and so on and so forth." <laughs> <laughs> I love whenever he talks about the dialectical. The di- he, I'm not. I what is he? How does he go? So he goes. I'm not Marxist. I, he's Hegelian. He's not Marxist. Get it right. He's Hegelian. <laughs> yeah. His, his debate with Jordan Peterson is one of the, like, yeah, I, I didn't, like, never have I so quickly lost respect for two men simultaneously. You know what I mean? Just uh, <laughs> simultaneously. I've never seen it. Like, I, the, everything I heard was that, like, he made Jordan Peterson look like an ass. No, they just, no, he just, like, I, I don't get me wrong. They're both stupid. But he also like didn't he didn't really engage like like it wasn't a debate that was had. Uh, I will Slavyov at least, but based on like what little I know about him or have seen of him, he he comes across more sincere than like a lot of these you, you thought leaders that exist now. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, he's a fucking he's a slob who's happy to be paid money for doing nothing, and he's like he's also an interesting guy in the sense that he's like a hardcore like what like socialist communist who thinks that like china is the devil he's like it's unconscionable what they're doing like Like, that's not a society to to his credit he didn't pivot to this like all these other guys like jordan b peterson matt walsh ben shapiro like all the like prominent thought leaders the intellectual dark web Mm-hmm. They had they had to like pivot to these things because they completely fucking failed at the thing they were trying to do. Yeah, and- he's always been a guy who's talked about like um what's what he what's the he says something like he wants like an alienated apparatus. He wants like a completely he like wants a flashlight. A- <laughs> yeah, he wants a <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Everybody's government mandated flashlight, which is one of the few things that he and Jordan Peterson agreed on. Um universal basic flashlight. Universal basic U- UBFL. Yeah. The classic. 
but you no, know, he wants like a he wants he essentially wants like society. He wants the the alienated apparatus he describes is like a society that like completely like take cares of and coddles him so that he can just like spend his time like having thoughts and painting. And it's like, sure, nice thought. But it's also called having yeah, rich parents. It's called having rich parents. And also <laughs> like, I don't know, man. Part of me is like, uh, if you completely remove every like aspect of hardship from life, then what are you going to paint about? You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, oranges. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that sucks, dude. <laughs> Do a painting of some apples. I don't know. I mean, I guess the I guess the the contradiction for this is that like most Soviet art, like a lot of communist art, is actually very very good. So maybe he's he's onto something. Yeah. Well, but also, I mean, it's because their lives sucked. Yeah. Well, I I, I I ideally in an ideal world, we would all just get to like not have to do anything. You could just like do podcasting for a living. Oh man, we're fucking getting there. We're getting there, dude. That's always been that's always been like my thing with like tech and AI and all that, like the f- the fear of like these things taking jobs just like let them like get like g- let us get to a point there'll be there'll be like immense suffering on the way there people are going to lose their asses and starve and die but then we'll get to a point where everybody looks around and goes oh shit i guess nobody has to work anymore all the <laughs> machines are doing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that i'm pretty terrified of that that seems pretty bad because i think like i think the machines will literally like uh I don't think that human creativity will flourish. I think it'll just, I think that we'll just, uh, like what, what scares me so much about AI to get serious for a minute mm-hmm. is that it gives people, they think they're being creative, but it gives them the end result like on demand and right. without the meaningful aspect of the process, which is the creating, you know what I mean? Like you just, you get satisfaction. Yeah, every, without, Everybody like, gets, everybody gets to be like, Oh, I'm the ideas man. Yeah. Yeah. And and these like these AI Instagram accounts, like the fact that they're like positioning themselves as like digital creators is like you're not, man. Yeah, yeah, okay. You came up like you did the bare minimum, which is like you thought of a sentence to describe the thing that you wanted to see, but then you did none of like the you did none of like the the creative process is like uh you're traveling inward when you make something. And that's actually how you get better. And that's actually you had me an inward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Anyway, but you. No, get, I, you know I know what, what you mean. Like, yeah, it, it is a scary thought that these things might replace like human creativity. But I'm just, you know, I just want them to replace like, you know, having to work at McDonald's. <laughs> well, that's like that. happening. That's yeah. happening. But but right along with that is like, here's the here's here's one of the fingers of the monkey's paw curling in on itself. They're also getting away. They're getting rid of the fucking self-serve soda machines at McDonald's. That sucks. So this is the future that you've kind of bought for yourself. Yeah. And the price is still going up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You. It's like, bro, let me fuck. Give me unfettered access to soda. What, I'm only going to fill it up two times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever read uh player piano by Vonnegut? No, I want to. It's on my list. It's kind of what that book's about is like in the future, like everything's automated. So the only people that actually work are the people like the engineers who like, you know, are are like the mechanics on these machines and like understand this technology. And then everyone else, like the entire all the other like labor force that did exist are just like drunk at the bar across the street. Yeah, it's, it's like this world where like the only people whose lives have any meaning are the ones that like just tinker with the machines that do all the work and then, yeah. and then everyone else is just kind of relegated to like just kind of hanging out you know yeah it's a it's 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 a conundrum for sure yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see how fucking shitty our lives get <laughs> yeah i mean we'll we'll find out in like seven months i feel like, <laughs> I, feel like, I, feel like... It's, I mean it's a it's a fucking like dangerous state of affairs that i you know the the I, I talked to Robbie about like the, the example that I used was like, cause like the, the talking about like grifting or just like the attention economy, like the age of content and all that and what creativity is, is like the example mm-hmm. I used was like, if you, if you spend like all these years, like learning the code and uh like becoming a developer or whatever. And like, say you get a job working for like rockstar to be on the team that makes the new grand theft auto, you probably make like mm-hmm. what, like six figures or whatever, but it's, you know, they you hit those like maybe maybe, but you hit those crunches where it's like 
you just don't see your family for like six months and you're like completely overworked and not really getting paid what you're worth. And you're like, de- like making the game, developing it. And then he gets released. And then like Dr. Disrespect or Markiplier, any of these guys just like set up a webcam and play it. And then they, you know, their net worth is like $40 million. Yeah. And, and it's funny, the, like being one of the people who makes a video, like there's even some glory in being like a, like part of the team that works on a movie. Right. Like there's, story, yeah. there's recognition, there's story, there's like awards for those people. You are truly a faceless drone. If you're programming for, you know, even like a huge video game, like, like Grand Theft Auto six. Sure. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's completely thankless. It's yeah, and the and the people who like make any real money in that industry are just like the guys who, when it's released, do like reaction videos to playing it. Yeah, and and, and so that's like all the like all the people that are like growing up and seeing this happen, their dreams are not to like do anything productive, like actually work on making shit. They just want to be content creators. Yeah, so that's like, that that's exactly yeah yeah. So like we're heading into we're heading into this world where like the the dream job for people is just reacting to the work of other people <laughs> video games is actually the best example for that because it literally used to be like kids who loved playing video games would wind up going into the industry and now kids who love playing video games like the aspiration is to play video games yeah i still don't understand it i like i've never watched a, t- a twitch stream and i i don't enjoy what like i don't enjoy the feeling of like like when i was a kid and like going over to a cousin's house and just watching them play mario which well is... there's i mean that like i get that a little more like in the room with somebody because it's like there's a like there's more of an interaction there and there can there can be you can engage with the thing and the person more than if you're just like watching a fucking twitch stream where they where they're not even saying interesting shit no i'm full boomer on twitch i i truly don't understand it and it kind of makes me angry that it is like that like adriana chechik is is making money playing video games so they're I, I, i'm convinced you're supposed to be getting fucked in the ass okay? <laughs> that's broke, your job <laughs> she broke her back she can't even she's great man she's twitch, ru- twitch ruined her life honestly <laughs> She, she but she's also like she's one of those people where it was never gonna work out there used to be like all of these like videos of her that got taken out because she used to do like i don't know if it was like molly or what but she would like do these crazy drugs and then like obviously like film like only fans videos but there was like i remember seeing like leaked videos where she would be out it was either in vegas or she might have been in north hollywood and it was literally her and her friends just like pissing on the side of the street yeah like, try, like you know un unwilling participants walking through you know and it's all like part of like their only fans content and it's just like you gotta be a fucking psycho to do that that's like Dude, a biohazard that's why i i like anytime i see the, like these bigger podcasts invite her like a lot of porn stars on the show it always feels like very exploitive to me like man you're just bringing like a really mentally ill woman to like talk to her about getting butt fucked oh yeah and, dude. and then like in the conversation it's revealed that like she was molested when she was 12 yes, and that's, yeah that's the reason she's just out of her fucking mind and you know think has no problem like prolapsing her ass on camera yeah and i've seen all of it just to make sure i know understand how bad it is yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. i've done the research <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah i'm literally i'm like i'm like nicholas cage in eight millimeter it's destroying me but i have to do it dude. <laughs> yeah you're like pete townsend you're like this is for research purposes <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's so awesome that's so funny because what was his argument there he was like <laughs> writing a book about it yeah yeah he was, <laughs> he was like right he was <laughs> he was just he was just being like a gumshoe like a like a boot leather shoe leather detective <laughs> <laughs> he's like you know i i have like terabytes of child porn because i'm like i'm actually like trying to help these kids <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome, dude. Oh my god, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I um yeah, I, there it, there is something like really disturbing about like where shit's headed in terms of like what people like just what people's dreams are now where it's like they don't even dream of being like necessarily creative or artists. Yeah. Which, which was like the the original grift was at least was like if I could just like become a comedian or an actor or whatever, I could make tons of money not having to like really work a real job. 
Yes. But it's there's still like an element of creativity to that. It's, it's like now it's like, can I like how can I just like play video games for a living? <laughs> and just not even like necessarily even yeah. like do anything on camera. Like that guy XQC just sits there and says nothing. And I think what kills me is like it's they're not even like they're they're playing video games for a living without seemingly even like having uh like discerning taste or like an appreciation for like what you because I think there is like there's sort of an art form to making a video game and there and there are video games that like stand tall above others, but you will watch these people just make shit content where they play shit games just to like fill up a 10 hour stream. And it's like, so you're not even like you're not even like becoming good at like consuming this thing that you consume for a living. You know what I mean? Like right. you're not, you're not, you're not engaging with it critically at all. Um, some of them do. I'm sure. I'm sure there are some people who have video game streams and they're, you know, they're really like appreciating the thing that, that they're. I like, the, I like that guy donkey. He does. Like, yes. That guy's yeah. good. He's great. His, his reviews are, are very funny and he, uh, you can tell he like loves video games. Yeah. But a lot, yeah, a lot of these guys, it's like this very contrived thing where they're like playing like Elden Ring or whatever, and they're just doing these like over the top reactions where they're like, "No way!" <laughs> yeah, it's, no, that's the, the way I play. At least my experience with video games is just sitting in complete silence, and then and then something happens, and I go, "This is fucking bullshit," and then I turn it <laughs> off. <laughs> That's probably the that's probably the most normal way to play video games. I'm 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 somebody who like I play Hideo Kojima games. Not like it'll like move me to tears while I'm playing. You know what? You know watching this, watching this game about a man with one eye and a robot arm trying to stop bipedal nuclear weapons, but also fall in love in the middle of the war zone of Afghanistan. I'm like, God damn, it's so beautiful. You know, I yeah. think I, I like I want people like I, I'm watching it like it's like an Ingmar Bergman movie. It kind of is. That's, it's like those yeah. isn't it like the fourth <laughs> Metal Gear Solid game is like. May, don't they say it's only like 45 minutes of gameplay <laughs> it's uh it, that game is if i could talk about it for a second that game is psychotic because it's it's four hours of gameplay nine hours of cutscenes, and the insane thing is they developed such a deep system like there are so they, you can interact with that environment in so many ways there's so many like things running all at once like there's so many ways that you can like distract guards, interact with them, their weapons you can deploy. You get basically no chance to do any of it. You, you there's no point to do any of it. I was like, <laughs> the I love that. That's like that, that Kurosawa thing where he would like go out of his way to like fill up drawers with like stuff that would actually be there. But yes, this, and it's just never actually in the movie. It's it's it is that to a T because the basically around the third or fourth hour in that game, just as you start to really discover like what you can do with all the mechanics of the game it funnels you into a completely like linear corridor of game design where now you have no choices you can't do you have to get it out of your system in the first two levels and then the game takes it away from you dude but, i heard but, some yeah. i heard i heard something that like when he was developing uh the third one that he wanted the that boss fight like the one the one against like the old guy to last uh, for a real week like like three weeks or something and like yeah could not konami was like no you can't do this <laughs> but but the third one is kind of like the two and three are the are the ones for me the third one is the happy medium of like it's that cool thing where if you if you turn the console off for a week and come back he'll actually be dead yeah i heard that yeah or like you can do this uh so your food in that game rots in real time so even so like when you're playing the game you'll collect rations that are good and then if you turn the console off and turn it on the next day uh, the food will have gone bad. You have to find new food. I love that. Um, I, love, I love grocery simulator. <laughs> yes, but it's but it's like, but what's cool about it is like you can also go out of your way and you can find the um, it's like this little side part of one of the missions. You can find the storehouse where the Russian army keeps their food, and if you destroy it, all the Russian soldiers will be hungry and they'll have no access to food. Then you can leave out your rotten food and give them all diarrhea. <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> that's cool. It, and it, that's cool, right? Like, that's like when I when I play that, I'm like, this is a fucking work of art. Like, yeah. you have like made something that is truly special. Yeah, I tried playing because I I was stoked on PT, and obviously mm -hmm. that that fell apart. 
so then like when those trailers first started coming out for death stranding i was like i'm fucking in dude this looks awesome yeah. and then i played it for like a couple of hours and i was like oh so it's like it's just paperboy it's just like the game paperboy but like Seriously. fucked up Here's what nobody wants to hear uh, about a video game, but I, for Kojima, I, I give him the pass. Uh, Death Stranding doesn't get good until about the 70th hour of the game. <laughs> and then it gets really, really good. Yeah, it's, it's an insane game. I, I just could not like deal with it because I was like, there's so many interesting like ideas and concepts in this. And like clearly a lot of work went into it. And, yeah. and there's a lot of cool guys involved, like Del Toro and Mads Mikkelsen and all that. Mm-hmm. And, and it, my favorite thing about it was the fact that he actually drinks Monster Energy Drink for yes. no reason. Like yes. that's just in the game, inexplicably. That well, even they, after they, the apocalypse, there's still Monster Energy Drink. <laughs> they 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 so they they re-released it because they did like a director's cut. Monster Energy Drink is not in the director's cut, but when you take a shower. <laughs> The, the display on the shower is an advertisement for Norman Reedus's. I Monster saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I love shit like that. I always love those sort of like meta things. Oh yeah, he, he puts in his games. Um, but the game itself, I was like, dude, I'm so fucking bored right now. This is crazy. The game I honestly tell people to play is a. Uh... The one that has the best gameplay, but they fired him like while he was making it. Uh, Metal Gear Solid Five is is vi- and I actually think the story is pretty good. There's and that's a- like a prequel. Uh, it's sort of Metal Gear Solid Five is a sequel to, to three, basically, but it's a prequel to the very. It ends. It's actually amazing. So it doesn't even conclude the story. No, it, it what it does is it completes a feedback loop. So the story concludes in four. But the very first Metal Gear game in so it's like the movie Primer. <laughs> yes. So 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 in Dalton, I'm sorry. Let me just spur on you for a minute. In 1980, right. 1987 was the first Metal Gear game on this console called the MSX in Japan. And the end of that game, um, you Solid Snake kills Big Boss, but then you find out that wasn't the real Big Boss. It was his body double. So the story of Metal Gear Solid Five is you think you're playing as Big Boss. You find out that you're actually playing as his body double, which you thought was just like a throwaway plot device from this game that was made in the 80s. Kojima's like, no, it's canon. You're playing as his body double. And the final scene of Metal Gear Solid 5 is you getting ready to walk into the room where Solid Snake kills you in 1987 in that original 8-bit game. And I actually think it's pretty fucking cool. Dude, his his mind, the way his mind works. <laughs> he well, he is just like an idiot. Like that. Like what is what, what's amazing about him is like he's like a horny, foolish mama's boy who just has the wherewithal to like bring all of his ideas to fruition. <laughs> like he, like his stories are ridiculous, but he sees them through. Yeah, I respect. I mean, I respect him. I always. I always, I always wonder, like, what is he up to when he posts? It's like when he posts like pictures of him and like Jordan Peele hanging out. Like, yeah, what, what is going on? Well, he is what he is really good at is like for all of his faults as a storyteller, he is a master of, of manipulating the audience. Honestly, in a way that I would like kind of compare to like David Lynch, yeah. where like um his his games, if you're paying attention to the plot, they literally make no sense, but emotionally they hit right right to the fucking heart <laughs> i i have a feeling that like his falling out with konami was like his fault uh i think it was definitely him wanting to spend probably like another 30 million dollars after already spending 80 million dollars on that game yeah like I, yeah. I i have a feeling that like he has all these crazy ideas and is probably like a difficult guy to work with and the the company was like can you just make a fucking video game yeah, he wanted to, like, incorporate... He wanted to figure out if there was a way, like, for Metal Gear Solid 2, he was, like, disappointed that, like, uh, the PS2 couldn't, like, emit smells. <laughs> like, he wanted, to, he wanted to be able to smell the ship. He wanted to smell the, 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 the cigarette in Snake's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, dude. I mean, I love that, you know, push the, push the fucking boundaries, dude. Get the smell of vision into the PlayStation. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry for uh, sorry for no, dude. I love this. I love this. I love I love him as just a guy. Like I, 
I don't necessarily engage with a lot of what he does because none of it makes any fucking sense to me. Yeah, he's, he's such an interesting dude, and like the just the the ideas he has and the shit he's like trying to do. I'm always like, I mean, fucking go for it, dude. <laughs> like this shit's wild. Have you ever this will this will and I you know I actually got to go and like probably soon. But have you ever um have you ever watched uh one of the it's one of the final codec calls in Metal Gear Solid Two. And it, it this it might send you into like a schizophrenic that, like, that one where he's like kind of like prophesizing what now he, is <laughs> yes he's prophesizing like um internet disinformation and memes yeah. and like Hideo Hideo Kojima was like one of the first people to like use meme like he like Metal Gear kind of like popularized like meme as a as a term. yeah Not, he I've wasn't seen, he, yeah I've seen what you're talking that that goes around the, like every few months that gets passed around the internet again like you know can you believe this. <laughs> Well, because it's it's one of those things that like when the game came out, like that was like the most criticized part of the game. Everyone was like, "What?" Everyone's like, "This is fu- what the fuck is this bullshit, dude?" Um, but now it's like it literally makes so much sense that it's it's eerie. Yeah, it's crazy. But, yeah, but I mean, people have had that idea for a long time. That like what what he talks about in that sequence that's been like a thing that great minds have been like scared of forever going back to like the 80s yes of, yes of course of course but just i don't know the way that it's articulated and granted it's also like translated so who knows if if some extra work wasn't done by the translator but the way that it's art the, the argument they're making for censoring for for internet censorship and surveillance um as a as a countermeasure to like eventual misinformation or disinformation yeah it's just is interesting I, I don't know i don't know if i'd ever heard it like articulated uh so presciently as in that codec call yeah i mean speaking of censorship the the thing i really don't like about those games is how much snake unalives people in the game <laughs> <laughs> they encourage you not to he doesn't want you to oh yeah, i guess so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't like it. I don't like it when people get unalived. Yeah, man, and it's really uh it's really triggering. <laughs> They've a- dude, they added a trigger warning to the re-releases of the games. It really? Yeah, man, it's crazy. That's a bummer. Yeah, I I can't believe we loot we like loot back around to like everybody's like tipper core now. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is censored like I Yeah. Yeah, like to see to see all these different like big time like comedians post these clips from their shows or whatever, and they have to like game the algorithm. So like I saw something where it's like that podcast that AJ Soprano does with the him and Meadow. Have you seen that? No, I think it was that show. They, they do they have like some deal with Tom Segura's network. They have a show on there. What? And they were censoring. Uh, no, it wasn't that. It was a uh, no. Soder was on your mom's house okay and they were censoring the word cigarette oh like fucking god yeah i mean that was like i remember when they uh when they changed the standards um so that any movie that depicted smoking would automatically get an r i like remember when that was a news story that was it was like it was like the early 10s i want to say and it's just like that i was i remember thinking like this seems like a slippery slope, doesn't it? Doesn't that seem a little fucking ridiculous? Yeah. But that's insane to censor the word cigarette. Dude, it's crazy. I mean, that goes back to like what you were saying earlier about like old Hollywood. Where it's like back in the day, it was fucking anything goes, dude. And now we, we've we come back around to like everybody, everybody's like clutching their pearls. It's like the, the fucking haze code almost. Yeah, seriously. Well, it's like, do you ever like... Uh, I do miss like censored movies on TV though. Like, do you ever see like uh, I think it was on BET? BET had weird censorship, right? They were showing one of the Medea movies, and it was a scene where Medea, like Mabel and like the whole Medea family, they're passing around a joint at a barbecue, but you can't show a joint on uh, BET, I guess, which seems oh, insane. So or- they put like a girls going wild like black they, bar they over put it. a bar over it <laughs> this was when i was in high school so I'm like it makes it look like a family of cannibals <laughs> like shellacked and hollowed out like a man's penis that they're now using as a bowl yeah you know like isn't it, it, it speaking of a man's penis isn't it isn't it interesting i guess you can't i don't know what the rules are in showing an erect penis but i was watching that don that new donald glover show swarm 
and there's a scene in it where like all the all the ratchet hoes are at some like nice like frat party like a bunch of white guys house and the main character goes in this room and there's like this guy in there who she sits down next to him and he's like is it okay if, like i'll pay you a thousand dollars if i could jerk off in front of you and so he like pulls his dick out and starts like beating off but it's like blurred out and i'm, I'm like can, yeah can you not even show a hard penis on amazon that that sometimes they just self-censor that stuff maybe yeah, I don't know. I'm, but think about it. I've never seen a hard penis. I've never in seen a, a hard in a movie. Right. I've never seen a hard penis, and I've never seen full pussy. Is that what like is like is that the standard for what constitutes pornography? I guess. Although I'm trying to think, I'm like, have I seen? I've seen a hard penis in um the movie Antichrist. But oh, I guess yeah, that makes sense. I guess. But it's a body double because you you literally see like uh insertion. You see like. If anyone's gonna put a hard penis in a movie, it's that guy. It's Lars von Trier. Yeah. Who apparently, apparently, the part of the reason why they used the stunt penis is because Willem Dafoe's cock is so big that it, it like, it didn't. <laughs> it wasn't believable. Well. Yes. <laughs> like, like the 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 thing with Omar in the wire, like he actually jumped out of like a five story building in real life. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, "That's not believable." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I tried to watch his like that movie he did with Matt Dillon. Um, I know people who love it. I couldn't get into it, dude. I just was it. Just it was like Man Bites Dog without like any of the charm. <laughs> like I'm just watching a guy do really bad things, and have I you, feel I feel bad. Have you seen that he is like um, Lars von Trier? He's like he's got some horrible degenerative disease. I don't know if it's like palsy or called like... being twisted. It's going, yeah, you got too twisted. It's called being fucking twisted, dude. No, but he's like, he's like losing control of his body. Um, and I think he already has like OCD, if I'm not mistaken. But he posted a video to his Instagram asking for a girlfriend because he's dying. I saw that. Yes. That's awesome. It is pretty sick, actually. That's pretty cool. That's a fucking Sigma move right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Sigma mindset. It's like, yo, I'm fucking dying. Does anybody want to have sex with me? Yeah, I don't even know if he wants sex. I think he just wants like a like female companionship. Oh, you think you, he's you, po- you think he's post horny? He you, you probably I mean he probably still wants you to like sit on his face occasionally, but that's a small price to pay for yeah. getting to be in the presence of one of the greatest art house directors of the nineties, you know. <laughs> Listen, really? you know, I, don't, play the I, game. I don't know if I've ever enjoyed a single of his movies I've watched. I've always I, wa- I always just feel bad. <laughs> like I feel sick right now. I agree, actually. But I, but I look. I'm not gonna. The man has accolades that I'm not gonna deny. Yeah, it's it's like why are you gonna why are you gonna make me feel how how are you gonna show me Bjork and make me feel sad? <laughs> <laughs> why are you trying to make why are you trying to make Bjork make me feel sad? She she makes me feel happy. Nope. You know? Not when I get my hands on her. <laughs> no, it's a it's illegal to have sex with a woman with Down syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> for now for now it feels yeah. like we're getting even like on that was like my thing where like you ever watch like a uh, love on the spectrum no i people tell me i should because like the my the, they the i've talked about this before but the interesting gamut that they run on that show is that like they will they have these people who are autistic and obviously that's a spectrum right but they'll start them out on a date with like a neurotypical person and that goes terribly doesn't work at all so then they'll have the autistic person date another autistic person somehow goes even worse if the autistic people like fail out on enough dates eventually a producer is like let's get a bitch with down syndrome in here and then (laughs) and and then like you you, those you've never those relationships work every time but i don't like if somebody is able to to date a neurotypical person and also a down syndrome. It's like at some point somebody's rights are being violated, right? You know what I mean? Like I, how I can... don't know. I I don't know. I don't I don't know like how debilitating down syndrome is. Well, I'm pretty sure that a neurotypical person, like, I don't know. It doesn't s- I feel like if you had sex with somebody with Down syndrome, that would be deemed like not consent irresponsible at least yeah irresponsible but then how but then how is it then okay for a neurotypical person to date an autistic person who's actually most compatible with the down you know what i mean like it yeah i don't know because they wouldn't they wouldn't have a show about people with down syndrome dating neurotypical people 
No. Well, you know, well, not yet, I man. Yeah, pitch, <laughs> pitch, pitch that, dude. Call up Ted Sarandos. <laughs> I mean, they do have like they have a new one now called Down for Love. Down for Love, but that but they're pairing up uh, Down syndrome with Down syndrome people. Oh, it's like animal husbandry. It is. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful. You have to be careful because apparently, like, if they, once they once those guys get a taste of sex, they just like can't. They lose their minds. Dude, so I remember yeah. we had these it's like the sharks these... and Finding Nemo. <laughs> yeah, the, the eyes go black. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. Oh I guess. So. I guess. I guess. Yeah, I guess because they they never get to really have sex. So you, I, now we get to observe what it's like when a down syndrome guy gets pussy i don't i think that's a box we don't we'll never if we open that we'll never get it shut that's dude that's the real, that's, that's the real hellraiser box <laughs> oh my god dude uh yeah i guess I, yeah, some things are better left unexamined yeah <laughs> like the sex lives of people with down syndrome could you imagine a bunch of toys just start shooting out of the walls and rip you apart. <laughs> we have we have such sights to show you. <laughs> Dude, yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. Uh, I know you got to get out of here. I do got to get out of here. We kind of covered um, and Emmett Walsh. I'm sorry. We, I think we mostly talked about Metal Gear Solid, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I didn't have a lot of direction going into this. I just thought it was like a fun idea, and this was fun. I am. I'll let you know. I'm really, really bad at staying on topic when I do. Like, it doesn't matter. It's it's like like honestly. First, honestly, like going into it, I was like, I don't, I don't exactly know how to do something like this because, like, it is an interest of mine, but it's also like, well, I haven't seen like all 200 of the movies that this guy's been in, so it's like. Just a good springboard for just being autistic. Yeah, <laughs> being like, I mean, I, I think we definitely did that. Yeah, because I can't like on the 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 uh, like actual show that I do now is like those two guys are just like in like guys they're in the sports and drinking beer and like all that kind of shit. So it's like they didn't even know who Guillermo del Toro was. Like I said, right? Like, I can't talk about like all this like autistic shit with them because they have no fucking clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> Whereas, like, it, it, somebody like you, it's like, yeah, dude, let's fucking talk about Kojima for an hour. I know. I'm sorry. I hope it's, I hope it's, my fear with all of this is, like, this is a great, like, uh, this would be such a great conversation to have, like, you know, sitting together in a room. I always worry that it's a bad uh, podcast. No, people love but... this shit. Like, I, I, dude, I've had so many people reach out to me about, like, just, like, the autistic obsessions I have. And they're like, hey, man, it's like. I know, I know you're like kind of doing a bit, but it's really fun to hear you talk about Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. <laughs> or or spurg out on how much you like the Mars Volta or whatever. <laughs> yeah, dude. Those are cool things to like. <laughs> yeah. Those, Those are, are like... cool things to like. Yeah. Uh that that's the biggest trap, by the way. we we'll, I guess we'll get it. We'll get we'll wrap back around on Russell Brand then. Because that's the thing that really bums me out the most about all of this is that movie, Get Him to the Greek, is the only movie I've seen that references the Mars. The Volta. Mars Volta, yeah. <laughs> and that's the biggest. That's the biggest bummer about all this is the one fucking movie that references that band and actually like features their music in the movie is, is, is not starring a fucking rapist. It is. It's crazy how. Uh, how much they're like tangentially in the news because of things like that because the Danny Masterson thing too yeah <laughs> Cedric Cedric's wife was like one of the one of the women right she was like yeah one of the main ones like he Cedric has been like the the kind of the champion of this for many many years like it's kind of like ruined his life for like the last really? decade yeah like the 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 church had like did all their shit with them that they usually like bug their house and fucking like killed their dogs and shit. And, and so like that's why like a lot of that um that at the driving album they did in 2017 a lot of that album is like his lyrics on that album are like talking about his struggles with this fucking church yeah and um yeah it's been like a huge part of his life like that family for a long time and i i mean good that they finally got the guy i heard that like 
he him and his wife and like all these other women are like at some point going to try and actually take the church itself to court i mean the church is dude the, the the church is bulletproof though because i mean it's like all you have to look at is the fact that like nobody has seen david miscavige's wife just hasn't been seen for 10 years brother i was on this when i was going through my psychosis this was I was obsessed with this. I was like, "Where is Shelly?" Like Where the, the official, <laughs> the official stance of the church is she's sleeping. Like she's she's taking a nap. She'll be down later. They've yeah. been saying that for a decade, dude. Yeah, the the church is kind of bulletproof, but it's like, I guess if, I guess if anybody's gonna take them down, it'll be um, the guy from the Mars Vault. <laughs> we did, uh, we did. I, you know, I had a, I had a weird. Uh, well, I'll end with this. Um, when I was still living in LA at the beginning of the year, uh, my friends from this band, the Callous Dowboys, who's a band I think you actually would like, they um they came to visit me and they they think it's fun to like go into like Scientology things and just like see like you know you shouldn't do this, but it's like you know we like to see like how far we can make it before like we really freak ourselves out. So we went to um. There's a museum on Sunset Boulevard called Psychiatry and Industry of Death. And you don't realize it's Scientology. Like, they don't advertise that it's a Scientology building. They have, like, this fake... Oh, it's like a speakeasy for Scientology? Well, <laughs> well yeah. No, what, it's, it's, it's really a trick. Because what they do is, like, they, they claim that it's, like, a... It's like the citizens, it's like the citizens watch agency. They, they make it look like it's like a government building. They have like an emblem with like an eagle on it and all this stuff. Like it's like a government agency, but it's just the church Scientology. And you go through this guided tour of like the insane, like racist, violent, evil history of psychiatry, you know, stuff that is true, but obviously it's being presented with like a serious bent as like, this is not, you know, you shouldn't turn to this. You should turn to like other methods, namely being like Scientology to solve your emotional problems but we went in there as a gag and i think they could smell it on us because they make you like fill out uh all of your they like make you fill out like all your contact info so they can get in touch with you and we obviously all put like bogus names but i panicked and i put down like the fake name that i chose was uh was leonard smalls from of mice and men so i like obviously a fake like i couldn't have blown my cover any faster <laughs> and so when we're going through the tour because i had done it once before with a girl and it wasn't that weird this time we went through we were the only ones there and as we were going through these like weird corridors that have like torture devices and all this stuff suddenly there were just like people like waiting for us like people who were like pretending to be on the tour but clearly had been like sent in through a side door to like monitor us and it's this it's crazy because like they like one of the last things on the tour is like they send you through like a replica of like um the classroom where dylan and eric like shot a bunch of kids in columbine nice yeah it's, and then you go so, into, it like, is, so it is like the the ride in house of a thousand corpses <laughs> it, it is a, a lot like house of a thousand corpses <laughs> down to like the last room is this like dingy dark scary like padded cell um and then you walk out of it after being like men mentally assaulted into this bright white corridor where um like there's these like there's these big letters that like help lies within us you know it, it, like it, and it and it has like a psychological effect like you, you you're freaked the fuck out then suddenly you walk into this very like inviting room with a big message that says everything's gonna be okay um and we got out of there and they immediately like separated us they immediately like separated us like when you go to like an e-reader uh that's like, a classic pick, pickup artist tactic yeah <laughs> <laughs> dude we almost let these old guys from the church scientology do whatever they wanted with our holes but yeah we had to like we had to like fight to get back together and then just like leave as a group it was very very fucked up it was dude, cool though yeah i mean that's my thing with scientology if i if like that's why it's i think dangerous to do what you guys are doing because if i did that I would just end up joining the church. I'd be yeah. like, yeah, dude, they're going to convince me. <laughs> like, I'm I'm not above this. It, it's like, it's, yeah, being like, I'm, I think I'm smarter than the church of Scientology is like saying, I'll, I'll try, I can try heroin. I'll do heroin once. Nobody, it's not going to get me. Yeah. It's no, not like it's, it's the most it's addictive the, drug in the world. It's the same as like anybody who claims that like, you know, the advertising doesn't work on them. And it's like, hey, buddy, everything is advertising. Obviously, it, like it works on all of us. So you're not like nobody's smarter than 
<laughs> any of this shit. I literally, I remember like being 17 years old, like acting like such an asshole. Just being like, who, <laughs> what commercials make you want to buy something? I was ordering pizza, pizza every Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> it's like i was ordering whole pizzas for myself i was like oh they oh they got the 20 dollars big box i gotta get that it's like fucking of course it does it's crazy yeah, i'm easily influenced. like i remember when like I'm trying to think like one example is like when zombie land came out and woody, Har- <laughs> woody harrelson's character in that movie is obsessed with twinkies yeah i was like dude i gotta i gotta have some fucking twinkies now fucking twinkies. and then i ate one and i was like i forgot how much these suck <laughs> they're awful they're so bad <laughs> yeah oh, they're not God. Uh, but you have you have any you want to you have any uh failed podcast you want to plug? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. I'm just doing stand up. If you live in Chicago, try to try to cal. So I'm gonna once I start getting like, I'm tr- I want to book shows soon. That's the fucking goal. But yeah, follow my Instagram. Any shows I do, I'll post on there. Yeah, Nick. What's your Nick? Oldershaw? Oh, at Nick Oldershaw. Yeah, it's it's my name, all one word. Yeah, nice and. Nice. Um, me, I'm just you know, I'm just trying to claw my way out of homelessness. I live in a box car. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, with, I guess with Wi-Fi. Well, I do these in the lobby of the Days Inn. They have their Wi-Fi set to guest. Um, <laughs> I get a Danish and a coffee. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. I, um, I guess yeah, I guess I'll try and I want to I want to get Robbie and I want to. I was telling him like this would be a fun thing for all three of us to do, and um, I guess I guess next time I do this, it'll be the I was thinking next time we'll do Knoxville's own Dale Dickey. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, and then and then probably you know we'll also talk about Crash Bandicoot for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, dude, I I loved it. I love I like that's the show. Honestly, it's just like have a topic set up, try and talk about it, and then just spurg out, dude. Yeah, I'm so good at it. Yeah, no, this was this was fun, man. Thanks for quite a, quite a quick three hours. <laughs> <laughs> I think we we maybe talked about the actual thing for like maybe like a half hour. <laughs> That's good. That's a show, it's good. dude. It's a fucking show, baby. It's content. No, I, I yeah, I appreciate you doing this. And then I yeah, um, yeah, I guess I guess like let's try and get like yeah, me and Robbie to talk about Dale Dickey sure <laughs> i'm down for that dude uh and then to the audience patreon.com slash corn fed with dalton pruitt this is this is the new show on the billionaire podcast network this is, you've been listening to where i seen them before a celebration of guys <laughs> <laughs> all right brother it was good to talk to you man this was nice yeah it was fun catching up yeah i get i when my life is better uh we i guess we can all hang out in person again <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be great yeah uh well uh be be safe yeah you too man <laughs> so, yeah bye <laughs> all right bye bye